Divine Truth Events. These are events and presentations by Jesus and Mary. This presentation is part of the Human Soul series. The topic is Anger is Your Guide. Presented by Jesus on the 26th of April 2009 in Brisbane, Queensland, Australia. This is session two. Now, what I would like to do is just ask you a few questions of um, what category do you feel you fit into? So, do you feel that you fit into the category where you have no anger at all inside of you? No. no. After our discussion yesterday. Okay. No. Do you feel you fit into the category where you've heavily suppressed your anger yes. and so you're not very conscious of how much anger is inside of you? Yes. Who feels that? So the majority of us, right? Okay. And how many of you feel that you're actually in your anger now? Like you're actually feeling in the anger. Okay, so there's a few in that state. And then how many feel that they're now very, they don't get angry as much because now they get to the causal emotion before they even get angry anymore? Who feels that? Okay. No worries. And by the way, I disagree with a number of you that put up your hands in those different categories based on what I can feel from you emotionally. But um, what I would like to do is uh, use the opportunity today to actually allow you to start addressing some of these things on a more personal level, if you would like to come up and do that with, with us. Um, and the, things that, the reason why I'd like you to encourage you to come up and talk about it is because um, usually what happens when a person comes up to talk about it, there's a law of attraction going on where other people will connect to those emotions. And, and that then enables all of us to start connecting and seeing the things that we do to either suppress our anger or feel our anger or then feel what's underneath the anger. So if we could just make sort of three categories, if you like. So the first category is the category of suppression. The second will be the category where we're actually living in anger for some of the time or a lot of the time. And the third is that we're actually accessing the causal emotions. So what I would like to do first is um, anyone who wants to visit me first in the hot seat, uh, if you could think about whether you feel that you're in this place of suppression or not, and if you'd like to talk about that with me, then I'd like to invite you to come up first. And then once we've talked about a bit of that, then we'll get into this. Uh, maybe we won't be getting into many things around my um, We'll get into this second state. That's working. We'll get into the second one of, of living in the anger and those people of you who feel that you're getting into the anger a lot and starting to express the anger but you're really concerned about that. And then um, we'll talk about getting into the causal emotion, the third, the third layer. Because what we want to do is, in the end, we want to get through the anger as rapidly as possible. Because the longer you stay in anger, the more difficult your life is going to become. So I'm not suggesting, although I'm saying that anger is your guide to finding truth and finding love in the end, I'm not suggesting you stay in anger because you won't find truth and love that way. It's by using the anger as like a torch showing your way into a deeper and darker place. Does that make sense? So the way I see anger is like holding a torch in your hand and you're walking along in a dark night and the torch is the only way you can see what's going on in front of you. And the way I see anger is very similar to that. that the anger is like a, a torch and the light being shown at what is dark inside of yourself. And that's why anger is your guide, because it helps you get into that place that's dark inside of yourself. If we stay in the anger, then what happens is that we will actually be in a place where we're living in the depths of darkness, but not actually doing anything with it. And we don't want to use our anger for that purpose. We want to use our anger as like a light shining on our real emotion that we want to deal with. Does that make sense to everyone? 
So, that bearing that in mind, there's just a few brief things I'd like to mention about the anger itself. And if you could think of it like layers coming off of you when you think of your anger. So, anger is like a layers of, of a protection, if you like, coming off of the raw emotion. So, if you could think of your raw emotion like a little core of raw emotion inside of you, and then what's happened is generally we've covered that core of emotion just like layers of an onion ring. We've covered that core emotion with layers of protection. The reason why we do that is because we're actually very afraid about experiencing fully the pain of that core emotion. So what we do, instead of just allowing the experience of the pain of the core emotion, which actually releases it, what we do instead is we place layers or blockages around that core emotion to protect ourselves from that emotion. And the layers can get so dense and complex that in the end we're not even conscious that that core emotion exists anymore within us. However, the reality is from God's perspective that that core emotion does exist within us. And the reality also is from God's perspective that unless we release that core emotion, we won't get closer to God. Now, the more layers there are around this core emotion, the more difficult it becomes to access the core emotion. So you can see how layers around the core emotion are a product of time as well. And they're also a product of how much abuse or difficulties we've had during our life. So if we've had a relatively smoother life or we're younger, then obviously we're going to find it a little bit easier to access the core emotion and get rid of the layers than if we've had a longer life or we've had a, a more of a, a life where we've been abuse, abused in our life. So obviously then the layers are usually greater. And it's the removal of these layers that get us down into that core emotion. So you can say these layers are our suppressions. That's where we suppress the actual core emotion. Now, a lot of times, those layers began to be constructed way before you had a conscious recollection of constructing them. Your parents constructed them for you, in many cases. So, for instance, let's say there was a core emotion inside of your parent. This is their core emotion now that they are denying. And they denied the core emotion. Those of you who came to the parenting group knew, know that every single core emotion that the parent denies the experience of, the child automatically experiences it, the child itself automatically experiences it as a reflection of what the parent is denying. Now, so at that point the child's not getting damaged so much because the child is actually experiencing the emotion, but the emotion is allowed to pass through them. Right? But where the damage enters the child is when the parent suppresses the emotion passing through the child as well. Which the parent, by the way, is highly likely to do because it's suppressing its own core emotion. So whenever it sees that emotion displayed in the child, it's going to also suppress the core emotion in the child. So what happens is, it's not so much the core emotion now that's entered the child, but it's the, the action of suppression that the parent has taken against the child receive or feeling the core emotion. Now, I'll give you an example of that. Let's say the child's just crying. So, two-year-old child or even a one-year-old child just crying, 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 right? Um, let's say the child's two. So, it's a child that's, that's now, you know, walking and uh, maybe talking a little, and, and the, but the child is just crying all the time. Now, the parent will highly likely at this point take a number of different actions. Because remember, the child crying is actually what the parent needs to do. Right? The parent needs to cry, but isn't crying. And that's why the child is crying, in the majority of cases. Now, I'm not saying, not if they've hurt themselves or something like that, although even the child hurting himself is a parent's law of attraction. But the child actually just crying for no seeming reason, then it's the parent denying the emotion within the parent. So the parent denies this grief and sadness in itself. The child fears the, feels that grief and sadness and then expresses that grief and sadness. It may take one of two options. It may go to the parent and hug the parent, right, in order to, because the child feels that the parent needs that kind of love from the child, 
or it may actually express the grief itself. It just depends on the personality of the child as to what it does. Now, if it goes and hugs the parent, what does the parent generally do? That the parent feels rewarding of that hug, doesn't it? So the parent now establishes an emotion on top of that grief that every time the child is crying, the child doesn't have to feel that grief, you're going to get a hug from me. right? And that is actually suppressing the parent's own emotion. Can you see how it works? There's this interaction going on. Now, now the child itself now has been taught a thing, and that is that as soon as it cries, it needs to be hugged. That's what the child's been taught. The child's also been taught that as soon as it cries, like the parent will respond with love to the child. Right? So that's what the child gets taught. Now, I use the word love, by the way, in quotation marks, because it may not be loving at all. What would be the motive of the parent hugging the child? To stop the child from crying, which is not a loving action. Like stopping anybody from doing anything is not a loving action. So, so a lot of times it's driven by another emotion. But, but the child then interprets that as love. So in that one instance, the child has learnt, two years of age, has learnt that love means if you cry, you get hugged. So now let's translate that child up to an adult. She's a woman in her 20, 25, she's married, she's got uh, her husband's around 20, you know, a bit older than her maybe, 26, 27, 30 or whatever. And whenever she cries, her husband gets angry with her. What's she going to feel? She's not being loved, is she? And so she's going to want a man who whenever she cries, he hugs her. That's what she's going to want. And she'll interpret that as love. Now, it may take her many years after that to work out actually that just because the man is hugging me, it doesn't mean he's loving me. Right? But that's a belief that's in her that came from two years of age. And she'll have so many layers, layers and layers around those beliefs. Does that make sense? So allow yourself to see as an adult that these layers around the core emotions will be many and varied and we've got to deconstruct these layers in order to get at the core emotion. Now, one of the biggest outermost layers, if you like, around this emotion is the layer of anger. Because what does layer, this layer do for us? This layer gives us a seeming sense of control, a seeming sense of um, uh, protection, and, and a seeming sense of defence against feeling or experiencing the core emotion. That's what's actually happening inside of ourselves. So anger in this case can often be used as a defence towards feeling the, all, of these layer, all of these different layers of emotions. That anger could also be used as an expectation of others to protect the emotion. So whenever for instance, in the, in the example I gave of the lady who's now married, whenever she cries and her husband isn't hugging her, she gets angry with him. So why is she getting angry with him? Because he's not helping her suppress the core emotion. Right? Right? He's not helping her do that. So the core emotion is maybe that I'm unloved or I'm unwanted or I've been rejected or whatever the core emotion is, but because if you, so if you're crying and you're getting angry with someone at the same time, then you are not dealing with core emotion. So you can, you can do that for years, cry and be angry with someone and not deal with the core emotion. Even things like suicide are, emo are actions taken with anger in most cases. Where you've become so angry with everyone around you and what they've created inside of you, and you don't want to allow yourself to actually feel your own emotion. So people in suicidal states are often very, very angry people. And in fact, there are many spirits who have passed in suicidal states, and the reasons why they pass into some of the lower parts of the spirit world is because they are so angry with everyone and they've blamed everyone for their life. Now, oftentimes this blame has some substance 
in the sense that many times in your own life you have been hurt or abused by someone else, right? But remember we said yesterday that there is no such thing as justifiable anger. Now justifiable anger, all you're doing is justifying yourself not experiencing that causal emotion. That's all you're doing, is justifying, giving yourself a good reason for not accessing that core emotion. And that core emotion, most of the time, will be a, a, will be a grief-based emotion, generally. So, so you're basically justifying yourself for not feeling your grief. You're giving yourself an out to not feel grief. So the purpose of the anger can be many and varied. In the notes you'll find under why we suppress anger, in the notes that you've got in front of you, you notice I've listed just some of the reasons why we actually shut down the anger. But then, over the page, you'll notice I've got a section of reasons why we get angry. And you notice I've listed 10 or 15 reasons why a person may get angry. And you can see that some of these reasons are like, there are all sorts of reasons of why we might get angry or frustrated with another person. But in the end, the core reason generally is that we do not wish to feel that emotion. The core emotion that we need to feel to release so that it's no longer in us. And it's actually this core emotion that creates our law of attraction. So that while that emotion remains with me, my law of attraction is going to keep on coming at me, triggering or attempting to access that core emotion. So if that core emotion is, I feel rejected, well, I'm going to get a series of things happening in my life where people reject me. Now, if the core emotion happens to be related to women rejecting me, then all of my, and I'm a male, then all of my love relationships, including with my mother, my sister, and any women that I have a relationship with in my life, the majority of them will end up rejecting me because of my law of attraction to trigger that emotion. But what I'll do then generally, if I get rejected from a woman, I then would then tend to, if I'm a male, get into anger with them, right? Feel upset with them for doing it. Why are you rejecting me? Get angry with them. Not understanding, actually, that my law of attraction is saying, actually, this is an emotion, rejection from women, that I need to actually feel to its causal level. Once I feel that emotion to its causal level, what will happen is the anger will no longer be present in any of these relationships. The causal emotion will be gone, and I'll now attract, start attracting women who actually care for me and love me and don't want to reject me. And in fact, even the relationships that I'm currently in, for instance, with my mother or my sister, will automatically begin to change. And whether they are aware of it even or not, that's what will happen. So, there's this process of suppression, and then of, even of our anger can occur. So that's another layer, if you like, on top. Can you see? So if the majority of us put up our hands saying, saying that we think we've suppressed even our anger. <coughs> so can you see that that's just added another layer on top of what we need to start accessing? So if you're suppressed even your anger, that's when there's this tendency to go really into your mind when you live your day-to-day -day life. Because you either live in your mind or you're going to get depressed. Now, many of us probably have experienced depression over our life, right? In, in, in various different forms. If we've experienced depression, then we have a tendency to suppress even the layer of anger, which, have, which is the which is the suppression of all of the other layers that lead to the core emotion. So when we get into this depressed state, or as some people describe themselves as numb emotionally, right? that I can't feel the emotion, I, can get it really, I can't seem to get at the emotion. If you're feeling numb emotionally, that's a layer that you've placed around, generally around the anger, in order to protect you from feeling the deeper emotions. So depression, numbness, or all these layers, or coldness. You might feel a sense of coldness within you, like towards the world and towards people generally. You might feel a, a feeling of distance with everyone you meet and then everyone in your life. Those are all layers of suppression of the actual anger, which then suppresses the <coughs> deeper emotions. So can you see the, 
the more suppression that we have, also, the more there's to undo. But in the end, all of these suppressive layers have occurred because we don't want to feel that. So the first thing generally that I do is start praying about why, like I first ask God to tell me why I am angry. What, what, is, what emotion am I trying to cover over? And generally the law of attraction will be showing you that even at the moment you're asking God that. Right? The second thing is then generally what I try to do is start praying about what am I afraid of about that emotion? What's my fear about this cause and emotion? And what that's done generally is allowed me to skip through a lot of these blockages really rapidly and get to the actual causal emotion and release that causal emotion. But it's your willingness to release the causal emotion that's going to define how rapidly this all works for you. Most of us are very, very unwilling because we see this emotion as a very powerful, overwhelming, emotion that's going to destroy our lives in most cases that's the way we feel and it is going to be a powerful and overwhelming emotion that's why we wrapped it up in all this cotton wool trying to protect it but in the end what we need to do is just allow ourselves to experience it if you allow yourself to experience it completely you will find it will be gone and also you will find there will be no reason for any layers above it anymore so all of the layers will be gone over that emotion as well. So, you can say there's a few ways to access it. You can access the block and go down the blocks that way, or you can really start focusing on the core emotion inside of yourself. So that's what we'll talk about a bit today. Now, if we're in this suppression <coughs> mode, which the majority of us feel we are at some point in that suppression mode, then we need to look at why we suppress. So what are the reasons why we suppress? Now on the first page of, your, of the outline that you were given yesterday, you've got, a, you've got why we suppress and how we suppress. Right? The anger itself. Now what I would do, firstly, if I was you, is just to start going down those lists and ticking the ones that you know you <coughs> use as, a, as personal tools to suppress what's underneath. So if you f have you found yourself worrying about people's judgment of you with emotion, for example? So how many of you feel, if you have an emotion, that you're going to be judged? How many of you feel that? So that's a fair majority of the audience. So, so that would be a, one of your tip. That's one of the techniques you use, worry about how others think about you. So what I would do then is I would start taking that to God. Like, so I'd say, all right, to God, help me find the reason and this has to be a desire in me. Remember, all prayer is not just a thought. It's a feeling in you that needs to be generated. So you're basically being asking God to, to help you generate a feeling that you want to access why you're worried about other people's judgment. So what are some of the reasons why you'd be worried about other people's judgment? Um, perhaps, can we have two people who are willing to do some roving microphones today? You want to do one? Thanks, David. You want to do a roving mic today? It, it means sort of walking up and down the aisle, handing out to people. So, so, uh, Carol, you'd like to? Thank you. All right, so if one takes the front part, one takes the back part. And, uh, all right, so, um, so the question is, why are some of the reasons why you'd be worried about per a person's judgment, do you think? What, what are the fears that you would have? Rejection. Rejection? Yeah, but you've also got to put up your hand. <laughs> so fear of rejection. So, so I'm going to be doing something for other people because I'm afraid that if I don't do this for other people how they want it done, that they are going to reject me. So once I've identified that emotion, I know straight away, if you think about it, I know straight away that the core emotion, one of the core emotions that I'm worried about is rejection. Does that make sense? So can you see in that, just that one instance, I've now identified a core emotion, even if it's an intellectual identification, I've now identified a core emotion as a reason why I might get angry or the reason why I've suppressed everything. Because I'm afraid of rejection. If I'm afraid of rejection, it means that I've got to yet feel the emotion of rejection. 
Does that follow? Can you see the linkage there? If I'm afraid of rejection, then inside of me there must be an emotion of rejection that I'm afraid of allowing myself to experience. And if that's the case, the fastest way for me to deal with that emotion is when I get triggered with an emotion of rejection to go straight into feeling. What's going to be the fastest way for me to get triggered with rejection? To stop doing something for someone else that they, I know they want me to do that I don't want to do. All I need to do is just stop it right now and I know the instant I do that, I'm going to get anger from them and I'm going to feel rejected. And if I can allow myself to get into the rejection, then I'll skip over all of these layers of suppression. And when the rejection disappears, what will happen to the most of the other layers? Of course, there's no longer any need to protect an emotion anymore. So many of those layers will disappear too. <coughs> can you see that? The relationship between those two things? Alright, what what's another emotion that I might have when I'm worried about a person's judgement? Being unlovable. Okay, I'm unlovable. So that's a pretty big core emotion, isn't it? Like, within myself. So if, if I'm now, I'm now to, so what am I doing? I'm pleasing other people so that they will love me. By the way, is that love that I'm really getting? No, because if you've got to please someone before they love you, then they don't love you. They're just getting something from you, right? But I, this is the thing that would have been set up when I was very young with my parents, for example. If you don't do what I say, or you don't do what I feel, is what most parents feel, then you don't love me anymore. And they taught us that very, at a very young age. So I'm unlovable. So the f fastest way for me to get into that emotion is allow, the law of attraction will already be bringing me this emotion. Stop doing things for the sake of getting love. And what will happen if you do that, you'll find that every single person in your life who doesn't really love you, you will get angry with you. So let's, let's give an example. Let's say um, one of the things I do for love is cook my family a meal. So if you're one of these ladies who, who <coughs> resent cooking meals all the time, and you're tired of cooking meals all the time, and you do it because it's the definition of being a good mum or a good wife, stop cooking a meal one night, don't tell anybody, just don't cook the meal for that night, and see what happens. And what will happen Coming back at you generally will be, what? What? <laughs> How can you be doing this, right? There'll be this really, really strong rejection back at you, saying, what are you doing? And you're saying, actually, I'm allowed to love myself and tonight I don't feel like cooking. Why don't you cook for me? And if you get anger back from that, what is that telling you? That actually this relationship isn't as loving as what you believed it was. You will start feeling unloved. So allow yourself to feel the emotion of being unloved. Can you see how it works? You can easily access these core emotions like that. The problem is the majority of the time is that these emotions feel so big inside of us that we don't allow ourselves to feel those emotions and instead what we do is we revert to some other form of suppression of that emotion. So for instance, the lady who doesn't, the lady who doesn't talk to her, um, sorry, who does it? Who, who keeps cooking for her uh, husband and children? All of a sudden, she decides one night she's going to have one night off. She takes one night off, and everyone in the family is upset with her. What does she do? How dare you get upset with me? Oh, I've cooked with you, for, cooked for you for twenty years, and you know you've never cooked for me. Like, what's she doing there? She's in this anger phase, denying the experience of the being unloved emotion. Does that make sense? She'd be far better off allowing herself just to, just to feel this terrible, overwhelming feeling that she actually has felt for quite some time in herself that she's not being loved doing this. And um, microphone. Hi. Um, I'd like to know, does it matter um, whether it's true or not that her family loves or doesn't love her if she feels it? Most of the time it will be true. So for in, the, in the example that I've just given you, the truth is if the family is getting angry at the woman who's cooked for them for 20 years and she's just taking a night off and all of a sudden they're angry, 
then they don't love her in that particular, at that particular moment, they do not love her. Do they? If they loved her, what would they do? They'd say, okay, mum, no worries, we'll cook for tonight. You sit down and have a relax. Wouldn't they do that if they were loving? I don't know, I've got an 11, 9 and 7 year old. Oh, then... It doesn't matter what age. <laughs> I don't cook anyway, my husband does it. <laughs> <laughs> But it really doesn't matter what age. Uh, obviously, until, unless they're little, little tiny children, there's a, there's a big difference there. But I'm talking about children that are able to go and get a sandwich for themselves or do something for themselves for an evening. If they're angry with mum for not doing it for them, then there's not love in that particular instance. Now, it doesn't mean they don't love her in other areas. It just means that in that particular state, they are not loving her. And if she, in that particular moment, allows herself to feel it, she'll get that triggered. Mary, uh, sorry. sorry, it was just a comment. If they're quite young children, they'll just be reflecting your own emotion about feeling, I'm not allowed to do this, and so they'll get angry at you. Exactly, yeah. So if they're very young children, they're just going to reflect back at you the fact that you, you feel you're not allowed to do it anyway. Yeah. So you know, the older they get, then if they're reflecting anger back at you for other reasons, it's because actually they've learnt to be selfish from you by you doing all these things for them and them not actually appreciating it. So their, their emotion will be triggered as well. But I'm not talking about their emotion, I'm saying focus on your emotion in that instance. Yep. So allow yourself to feel your emotion. Um, And then behind you, can okay. oh, yeah. I was just wondering, with that call and the anger, the emotion of I'm not, I'm unloving, or I'm not unloved. unloved. Now, that anger is that the causal that you were talking about yesterday to get to to get it out to release it? No, this anger is like an adult anger that I'm using to get away from the cause. So this is the childhood emotion I need to release, and this anger is the adult anger that I'm using to actually cover over that. The child anger, if I have child anger, it will be down here somewhere, in the list of wrappers, if you like, of what's wrapped around this emotion. Because normally what happens when we have a causal emotion at a childhood level that we're not allowed to release when we're a child, we immediately put anger around that emotion. So is that deeper again? That's deeper again. So it's like, there's the adult anger, and then there's some other emotions of blockages, which is usually, how do other people think of me? You know, I'm not going to be able to do this, and a lot of other things like that. And then we get down to, I'm really angry as a child about being unloved, and then there's the feeling of being unloved. And that's the feeling in the end that we're aiming for. The feeling that we're aiming to release is the feeling that created all of these other things. That we, we, and the reason why we created all these other things is because we wanted to protect that feeling of being unloved. Does that make sense? I've become very aware that I suppress anger because um, I have a feeling that I'll, that I'll end up all alone and I somehow won't cope with that. Right. It would be sort of almost like dying. Okay, so there's a deep emotional belief in you. So we could say the deep core of belief is that I'm alone and I had a deep core belief that I'm nothing. To anybody. Right? Now, those things are not true in that there are many spirit friends around you who feel that they were always with you, and of course God's always with you, wanting a relationship with you, and God certainly doesn't believe you're nothing, but you believe it, and it comes from your childhood, and it is an emotion that you need to allow yourself to feel. So if you become so if you're using anger to not get away to get away from that emotion then start seeing the relationship between your anger and that emotion and say, oh, I'm just angry again because again I don't want to be alone. You know, just, even if you just tell yourself that message, you're going to be one step further towards feeling the feeling of alone and allowing yourself to feel it. The truth is that none of us are alone, ever. But you're not going to feel that truth until you release that emotion. Until you release that emotion, you are going to believe there is a state in your life where you could be totally alone. And my feelings of being alone were so great that there was a time in my physical life, in this life, where I was totally alone. My parents wouldn't speak to me, my children wouldn't speak to me, none of my friends would speak to me. I lived alone and, and I did 
like, and I didn't have any work because I was so in my emotional turmoil at the time, quite suicidal, totally alone. And that's how much alone feeling I had to deal with. And then it took, it took me about a year or so of processing in that, in that state to get through that feeling of, and release that feeling of being just totally alone. Nobody wants me, feeling. Nobody cares about me. And the truth for my life was that that's exactly the truth. At that moment, nobody did. And that's the irony of dealing with a lot of these emotions, is you'll find, actually, that the truth is in those situations, just like the truth with the mum cooking the meal, is, no, right at that moment, her family are not loving her. Right at that moment, she's not experiencing love. She feels unloved, and she's right. She is unloved, and she needs to feel that. But it's the unloved feeling that creates the attraction. Does that make sense? Like... This is the thing we've got to understand. So it was my deep alone feeling, which was, which was so great that it created a situation in my life where I was totally alone, that nobody wanted anything to do with Every single person I knew. And I had to then just allow myself to feel that feeling, which took some time <laughs> to do, obviously. Now, as I dealt with that feeling, people started coming into my life again. So the first ones who started coming into my life were my sons, and they came back into my life. And then the next ones, that I, you know, then I attracted a partner, and then, and then, you know what I mean? So things started happening then. I started getting friends that I'd never had before. They were starting to attract into my life, but only after I dealt with that feeling of being totally alone. My suggestion is don't wait that long. Like I was pretty stubborn on that emotion, so stubborn that I had to actually be totally alone in my life physically before I deal with the emotion. My suggestion is don't wait that long. You know, if you feel the feeling of I'm alone just in an instant, let yourself go into the feeling straight away rather than waiting and waiting for years and years until the, you get to a point where you are in, you are totally that thing. Um, quite a few years ago, I went through that alone. It was like I was so invisible that God didn't even know I existed. Yes. And I stayed with that. And then it was like I was hiding from God. And then to know that that was not so was hysterical. And I burst out laughing and laughing. Yeah. But yet, I'm wondering is there another cause? Because I still am afraid of being shunned or rejected or not seen so it seems like all of that would have gone in that instant but it's not and this is the thing to understand about core emotion if the core emotion that you've dealt that you feel you're dealt with is the cause of your life then instantly your life will change but if the core emotion is is deeper than that or has more facets to it, it your life will not change so that, your law of attraction tells you straight away whether you have actually released the core emotion or not. So the answer, obviously, for yourself is, no, there's more to this core emotion. And maybe you burst out laughing just at the time that there was something deeper there. Because often that is the case, where we revert to humour in order to cover over an emotion as well. So, so allow yourself to just experiment and pray about that a little more. And, and allow yourself to dig a bit deeper into that. And it may not be related to God, but you may find that it's related to you and how you view you. And in fact, you'll find many of your emotions will actually be related to how you view yourself rather than how other people view you. For example, if a lot of this, like, I'm unlovable, I'm, basically what I'm doing when I'm saying that you know, I'm unlovable, there's this projection coming out of me as, you don't love me to the world. If I'm unlovable, then there's a projection coming out of me, you don't love me. Now, there's, a, there's also an emotion inside of me, a deep emotional belief inside of me that I am totally unable to be loved. Does that make sense? And that will be under the I'm unlovable emotion. So I'm unlovable can actually finish up being a capping emotion and underneath the I'm unlovable is there's something so bad or wrong with me that I'm actually unable to be loved. So even if, even if 
like somebody could love me, they can't because I'm unable to be loved. Right? So there's some really deep causal emotions. So you may find that there's these layers of some of these really deep core emotions that you need to dig deeper into. It's your law of attraction that tells you that it's not done yet. As soon as your law of attraction changes, you know, ah, I've, I've dealt with a fair bit there now. You know, I can feel my law of attraction changing. Everything's starting to be different. So that means I'm getting to the core of this now. I'm really getting to the underlying emotion now. If my law of attraction isn't changing, then it means that I'm yet to really pinpoint the underlying emotion. So more prayer about it, you know, more longing to God about giving you the answers about what's going on. And, of course, if, if I'm not, get, not getting to a core, then usually it means that I do not want to yet get to the core. So there's usually fear associated with the core. So, for example, I've gone through the emotion that I am unable to be loved by my soulmate. It's just like she's never going to love me. And then in, a, in that emotion, I found a lot of basic core emotions. One of the core emotions that I dealt with even just recently was she won't be able to love me because the other times that she's loved me, I was perfect. Now I'm not perfect. She's not going to be able to love that. Does that make sense? So that was one facet of that emotion. And there are other facets of that emotion that I need to work through. So they're all beliefs about myself in the end that I'm projecting onto my soulmate. That I'm saying she will have this feeling when in fact Mary doesn't have that feeling, it's me who has that feeling. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Up, right at the back. Thanks, Kara. Um, could you address persecution under that heading of rejection and mm -hmm. I'm unlovable? Like that slave that was talking, so say you had come to her while she was in the box being physically um, hidden away in the shed and told her all those things mm -hmm. and she... It was a male actually, a male oh, slave. sorry, yeah. he, um, and addressed, so she addressed, well he addressed all those emotions but physically he's still being persecuted. What would have happened to him and also relating to us as well? So those poor emotions of persecution, so when we get down to them, yeah. like what you were saying, your deeper deeper emotion was death when it comes and it was all to do with money. So you were killed because you were persecuted for people's beliefs about money. Mm -hmm. So how do we get over those deeper fears for the world where we know we're going to be persecuted? And in Australia it doesn't happen but I can see the wider world where it's happening all the time. Yeah. And it's happened for our grandfathers when we're celebrating Alec Anzac Day and they've gone through their lives, yes. living, their whole lives have been revolved around this persecution. Yes. And the answer is that what we see as truth is not what God sees as truth. Remember, on this path, what you're looking at is what is God's truth, not what is your own truth. So when I, when I was in the first century being hung on the stake, I wasn't uh, looking at, you know, I, I, I didn't have an emotion then of feeling persecuted. Because I knew that I wasn't. No. Because I knew God's truth, and that was that my soul was still free no matter what people tried to do to my material body. Does that make sense? So if I was believing that I was persecuted in that moment, it would be because I had a false belief inside of myself that needs to be released in that moment that I can, that I can choose to release. So getting back to your example about the slave spirit, what it could have done in that state, of, in the shed, is he could have fully released his fear and terror, and then underneath the fear and terror would be the, you know, the feeling of you know, being persecuted or being tortured, and he could have released that emotion completely and allowed himself to get into a state of complete calm. Now, now he couldn't do that given the emotional injuries that he already had. He would have to have been pretty close to a one with God to actually do that, but that's something that could occur. So often when we're looking at situations here on the earth, we're saying to ourselves, well, this is how it really is now, and we, and we don't see how God sees it. We, we're only seeing it how we're seeing it. So he could have chosen to go into his emotions, and if he released the causal emotion of being persecuted, 
the, the slave owner, their master, would have probably chosen another person to imprison in that way, rather than, if the master didn't change his emotion, he would have chosen another person rather than that person, because that person's law of attraction would have changed. See, the problem is today is the majority of do, do not trust law of attraction. That's really the issue here. We don't believe, you don't, many of us do not have a belief in our hearts that if I change a causal emotion, my law of attraction will change. We don't have that belief. It is a truth that we do not believe. And so what we do then is we justify. We say, oh, what's the point in me feeling this emotion of rejection? Nothing is going to change in my life if I feel that emotion. And I will have just cried for four weeks or eight weeks or however long it's going to take to feel this emotion and nothing will change. I don't have a hope or a belief inside of me that anything will change. But the truth is that if I do deal with that core emotion, something will actually change instantly and I've never had that experience my entire life of seeing the relationship between changing a core emotion and seeing the law of, 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 of attraction change. So until you have your first experience of your law of attraction changing, you won't believe what I'm saying to you until, that, go, until you go through that emotion. Is that, does uh, that yeah, sense? I believe that. It's just, um, I'm no, just thinking. You, I'm sorry, but you do not. Your question tells me you do not. So, you see, this is where we can often tell us ourselves in our mind like that we believe something, but that belief is yet to fully enter our heart. Our belief, that belief has fully entered our heart. So, so, in your case, you believe completely in your mind that if you change a core emotion, your law of attraction will change. But in your heart, which drove your question, you do not believe the law of attraction will affect even an event where a man is in prison being persecuted. And I'm saying to you, yes, it will affect that event, just like it will affect every other event when the core emotion is dealt with. Does that make sense? Whereas at the moment, in your heart, you don't see how that can be the case. So, so that's, that is the answer to give to all the politicians who are going off to Afghanistan and Iraq and, Iraq, and, Iraq, and, and are fighting all those wars because they're believing that they're fighting evil, that they just have to believe in what you're saying and everything will change. Yes, everything will change. And the, and the truth is that they, they are not fighting evil, they are creating more evil. Mm. That's what the truth is. And it's because of an emotion inside of themselves that they think that they have, and that they think they have the right to oppress another person in order to combat so-called evil, and they're actually now using evil to create to combat evil. That's what they're doing, and of course, it's never going to work, and that's why it never does work, and that's why all these wars keep on happening, keep on happening, keep on happening, keep on happening, because nobody wants to accept the truth, and it, it gets back down to this statement: if I'm getting the same results, then I'm not changing the cause. What, and there's a, that other statement, well, how's it go? How stupid is it to keep doing the same thing over and over, getting the same result? And this is the trouble with the world today, is that we keep doing things, the same thing, over and over and over and over and over again, hoping for a different result. And it's not going to happen that way. We need to actually start addressing it at the core level, the emotional level. So yes, all of the people who go to war and all the people who want to send them to war all need to change something at the emotional level in their belief structure. And when that happens, wars will cease. The law of attraction will change when that happens. And that starts with each of us doing it ourselves. Um, AJ, one of the things I found uh, with my anger is that I um, had trouble coming to the core emotion because to get to the core emotion, I felt I had to be vulnerable. You know, that sense of allowing myself. And when I went down that feeling of what does a vulnerable mean to me, mm -hmm. um, it was that it's actually at the time when I was, or I was young and vulnerable that all these things happen. Okay. So, so what does vulnerable mean to you? Um, no protection and uh, 
all sorts of things come up when I go down there. It's like, yep. where will you go? Um, who's protecting me if my parents are meant to protect me? Yep. Um, if I'm meant to be vulnerable and I was vulnerable before and all of these things happened and a bit of that, like that rage of, well, what's the point of it all, you know? Um, yep. uh, you know, I've been there and I've done that and this is what it's not me sort of attitude. And so I, Can I, I stop you there, though, for a second? And there's a big thing that's, that's not factored into your reasoning, though. And that is that, who was your parent then? It was these parents who you were vulnerable to and they damaged you. They were your parents then. Who's your parents now? God's your parent now. And that's the thing that you, you're not allowing yourself to be vulnerable with this new parent, God who is able to protect you, who is the only one probably on this planet who's able to love you, and the only one probably able to help you as well. And can you see the relationship there? If I believe that God is this new parent that can actually supply these different needs to me and have some faith in that, then I'll be more tempted to go into the vulnerable space with God. Yeah, actually, um, I had a lot of blocks, and I still do, but... Um with all the attempts I made, the only way I found really to get some way into it was to pray to God. Exactly. And constantly, even though I felt like not worthy enough for Him to hear me or whether I really believed in God, because if I did, I wouldn't be doing what I did. Um, I just keep trying and that has helped me access some of the uh, emotions underneath. Yes. Um, but if I still come back sometimes about the vulnerable and stay in the anger and, you know, that, that. Well, let, let's look at the vulnerable issue itself. What, what's happening is that, that you're opening up your vulnerability, you, you're attempting to, but you're still thinking it's aimed towards people on this earth and people, you know, towards people generally. The first person to open up your vulnerability towards is God. Because God is the only person that's going to accept your vulnerability without harming you. Does that make sense? And then allow yourself to actually demonstrate vulnerability at least in that relationship. So that's the first relationship you want to demonstrate this vulnerability in. Once you demonstrate the vulnerability in the first relationship, then as God's love enters you and heals the, the emotion, you become reassured in fact that no matter what happens to you, God and you are always going to be together. No matter what happens to you around you. So it doesn't matter who treats you badly, who treats you well, God is still going to be the constant that's going to be, that you're going to be com out of be completely open and vulnerable towards, and God's love is going to keep you secure in that place. And that's the emotion you're working through, and that's a very powerful emotion. When you get through that emotion, you'll find you'll feel very, very different about being vulnerable to everyone else. Because often it's the fear of being punished or the fear of being harmed again that causes to withdraw from being vulnerable. But if I know that I've got one person in this universe who I'll never get harmed from and who will always love me no matter what happens to me, and I believe that in my heart, I have this feeling in my heart that that's true, then no matter what happens around me will never really affect me. Does that make sense? So allow yourself to start ex experiencing your vulnerability towards God first. So don't worry about it so much with everyone else. Focus on being completely open and vulnerable towards God first. And when you do that, a lot of love, God's love will enter you. You'll feel a secure bond between you and God. And that will actually allow you to begin being vulnerable with other people. And when you get vulnerable with other people, you'll find actually the same principles apply with your vulnerability with God. Actually, most people are attracted to it. And you'll find that that will also then grow your confidence with regard to this being truthful in your own life. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry in advance, this is a bit of a muddly question. Um, I'm here, busily trying to absorb all of this stuff and the layers and the names and get it all right in my head. And I'm conscious that, as usual, I'm getting overwhelmed with having to keep track of it all. Yeah. And not so long ago, I thought, this is ridiculous. Um, 
it must it has it's easier than this, I know it. And um, I should just make the most of any emotion that I'm feeling and feel it and don't even think so, about it. So what's the emotion you're feeling right now? Oh, I'm a bit frightened now. You're overwhelmed. Overwhelmed, yes. That was the emotion you were feeling. Yeah, I'm often like that. But so, so you're overwhelmed because there's all these messages coming at your head, and you're so used to using your head to sort everything out. Yeah. And but there's this feeling inside of you now building. It's I don't understand. I don't understand. I don't understand. I'm not getting this. I don't understand. So you're trying to understand it intellectually, but the emotion inside of you is I don't understand. So, so allow yourself to feel that. Allow yourself to just start sinking into, I give up. I don't understand what the hell is going on. But, and let yourself feel that emotion. Because when you feel that emotion, all of a sudden you'll have some clarity in your head. And you'll be able to also get things there. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm aware of that. Yep. I've done that. <laughs> no, you haven't. Or maybe I haven't. Okay, no. but that wasn't really my question. I know, there. I know. So keep going. Um, what, what I've been doing lately, and you said something before that I wondered if you could clarify. What I've been doing lately is if I feel something, I just think, oh, I'll just feel it. I won't try and work it out. Yeah. Um, so I feel sad, and I feel sad, and it's nice feeling sad, actually, because when I'm sad, God is very close to me. Exactly. Um, but then before you said something about sadness and anger, and I thought, am I not allowed to feel sad? Because I know that. I must have a lot of anger. I'm learning that I must have a lot of anger. So does that mean feeling sad is avoiding something? No, no. See, now you're trying to get back into your mind again. What you're yeah. doing is right. The message you're saying to yourself is, I'm sad, I don't know what it's about, I'm allowed to feel it, so I feel it. That's good. And if you're sad and you're not crying, though, then obviously there's a deeper layer you could go to in the sadness. Does that make sense? So ask, the only thing I do, there's only one question I ask myself and that is what am I afraid of? I always just ask myself that question, what am I afraid of? Because it's always something I'm afraid of that stops me from going deeper. When you're sad, you ask yourself what you're afraid of. Whatever, when I'm sad but not crying. There's crying and crying. Like <laughs> uh, if I'm not wholeheartedly sobbing my eyes out like, and other people do. Yep. Is that worthless? No, it's not worthless, but there is a fear. Do, do you see the relationship? Look, none, nothing you do to help you access your emotion is worthless. So don't believe that. Everything you do to access an emotion is, is worth something. But if I am not sobbing my heart out when I'm sad, then I am not fully yet into the emotion. And there's a reason why, and that is I'm afraid of something. So that's why I keep asking myself, if, I'm not, if I know I'm not in the deepest of the emotion, I just ask myself, what am I afraid of? And I talk to God about that. What I say to God, what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid that you'll you know, do this, or they'll do that, or I'm afraid that this will happen, I'm afraid. And I just talk about that. So I might be just having a few tears, but not yet into the real deep emotion of it. And, and I just ask myself, what am I afraid of? And I start, but I don't even, now I just say to God, I start just talking to God, what am I afraid of? About going deeper into this emotion. Because unless you are right in the emotion, there is something you're afraid of that's still stopping you from fully feeling the emotion. So there's two things I can do when I'm crying a little bit. One is ask what I'm afraid of. What I've always done is said, okay, God, here I am, you can hear me now. Can you help me on a bit? So yep. Is there a whole lot of things you can do? No, no, that's all you need. That's all you need to do because in that moment, you'll, things will start popping into your mind what you're afraid of. And if you just talk to them, talk them back to God, like, this is what I'm afraid of. Ah, oh, this is what I'm afraid of. When I was a kid, this happened. You know, you start saying things, you'll actually start connecting more to the grief that's underneath the fear when you start expressing the fear. Does that make sense? Like, so it's always a fear? Like, it's not what I'm sad about, it's what I'm afraid of. Um, no, because it, because if you were fully sad about that thing, you would be fully feeling the sadness and you'll be in a sobbing state. Does that make sense? So there's always a fear sort of capping that. And it's the same with all of our emotions in the end. If we're not fully experiencing the emotion just like a child would experience it. So, you know, you take a lolly off a child and the child is just heartbroken, right? 
you imagine a two-year-old here and it's there sucking on a lolly and you grab the lolly out of its mouth and take it away, what happens to the two-year-old? Oh, if they do a tantrum and then what do they get into? Sobbing on the floor like this at the end of the world, right? Just because of the lolly being taken off them, right? So, so in the end, we will be like that with regard to the emotion. We will be, if we're in grief, we'll be in grief, like sobbing our heart out and we'll feel it exiting us. We'll just feel this powerful emotion of grief just overwhelming us completely. If I'm not yet at that level of processing the emotion, then there is still a fear preventing the emotion from fully flowing through me. And the fear might be afraid of judgment of others. It might be afraid of our next door neighbour hearing me. It might be, you know, it could be anything, just even simple like that, that your next door neighbours, like while I was processing a lot of my grief, my next door neighbour's home was two metres away from my bedroom. Now, of course, they heard everything I was doing. I could hear everything they were doing in their bedroom. So they certainly heard everything I was doing in mine. Right? And so, so, you know, that was one of the fears that I had to allow myself to work through, that it didn't matter, you know, it didn't matter if they were going to even come and knock on the door. I had to work through that fear. And when I worked through that fear, I could more fully get into that emotion, that, that causal emotion. So yes, unless you're fully experiencing the emotion as it is in its raw state, there will be a fear stopping the full experience. Allow yourself to look at the fear and ask yourself about the fear and ask God about the fear because processing the fear is about part of processing the emotion. It's about this process of clearing everything out of you, including every fear you have will leave you as well. Does that, that make sense? So just those two things there and nothing else. You don't need to do anything else. It's really, that's why it's so simple. You don't have to work it all out, you know? Yeah. Yep. Um. We were always taught when we were children that Jesus was going to come and he was going to take the good people with us, with him and the bad people were going to stay behind. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was also, my mother even made it a little bit better and just it was going to happen in our lifetime, yep. which was right anyway. And, <laughs> uh, Partly right. <laughs> <laughs> but what had happened was um, in Europe we came home for lunch at school and I came home one time and there was no one home. Everything was open, the doors were open and my mother had gone and there was, and I got into absolute panic because Jesus had come and he had taken everyone away and he left me behind. Absolute panic and yep. it was the ultimate rejection of God rejected me because I wasn't good enough because yep. they were going to go to heaven. I was now going to go to hell and burn forever and ever and yeah. ever. Yeah. Or there was also some story going around with a millstone around your neck or something and chucked into somewhere. Yeah. And yeah, and um, uh, maybe that I'm finding it really hard to connect with God, I suppose, in yeah. a way. Yeah. I try, I try, but I said, you're listening to me, are you taking notes of all this? <laughs> you know, yeah. 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 yeah, those kind of causal events when we're little, usually based around religion, have a huge effect on our relationship with God. And like I, I've heard of ones who, you know, they felt a real passion for God and then they realised that anybody with a passion for God had to be a nun or a priest. You know, so they didn't want to be a nun or a priest, so they couldn't be, have a passion for God anymore. Or Then there's others who, you know, in the name of God, have had very, very unloving treatment, even abusive treatment, sexually abusive and and violent treatment given to them. So obviously they then attribute that treatment to God. And so the very first emotions, my suggestion is the very first emotions that you deal with, if you can make them what they are about God and, and, and what you feel about God, it's going to help you greatly with the other emotions that you deal with. So the emotion that you feel is this deep feeling that God has rejected you. So allow yourself to start, you know, pray about that emotion. Allow yourself to start stepping into that emotion as well. That, in fact, God doesn't want you. Yeah. He wants everyone else but you. And allow yourself to start really stepping into that emotion and fully feel that feeling of rejection that you feel from God. The truth is that down the track you'll feel quite differently about God. But right at the moment, let yourself feel that emotion. Because that emotion will open a gateway into the other emotions you have and then you'll also feel God helping you through the other emotions. Does that make sense? Yes. So if you can do that, you'll find that 
your relationship with God will get re-established. At the moment, the, it's very difficult for you to pray to someone who you feel has already rejected you. That's right. Yeah. 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 So allow yourself to fully feel the rejection. Like Place yourself in a position where you feel that God re has rejected you and just does not want you. Let yourself feel that emotion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in accessing childhood um, causal emotions, I've done a lot of processing on myself in sort of getting to the bottom of this belief that I have that I'm all alone in the world. Yeah. And I sort of have a terror of finding an event that is so horrifying that, I, that it would be just, you know, a terrifying thing for me to remember. But I've actually never remembered any one terrifying event. Do you have to find sort of dredge until you find a terrifying event? Or can it be just a whole series of... I mean, I've, I've accessed fear of the dark and many other things in, in searching for why I feel alone. But I've never really come to any... You know, pot of gold. Okay, how many of you feel there is one terrifying event that is in your life that you feel is there but you just can't access? Like, there's, you'll find there's quite a number in the audience who feel this way. The answer is yes, there is one terrifying event that is in your life that you can't access. Right? For those people. Now, now there is a deep level of terror surrounding accessing the event. And this applies to yourself. There is a deep level of terror around access, accessing the event. So what, I, what I, I've had similar terrifying events to access. So what, you notice all of a sudden, me just confirming with you that there is an event is all of a sudden bringing up emotion for you. So what I'm, your, your own soul is confirming the truth that there is this terrifying event that you will eventually access. Does that make sense? Now, just allow yourself to understand that that's true. That's the first step, is to allow yourself to understand the truth. The, the denial that you've had up to this point is that you haven't wanted to believe that that would be true. Right? And that's why it's hard to access the event. Now, most of these events have surround abusive childhood situations. Right? Either sexual abuse, violent abuse, physical abuse, you know, um, sorry, mental. mental abuse even, but usually it's something physically painful that occurred and um, that these are kind of events surround. Allow yourself to understand that yes, there probably is this one event and there, for many there could be more than one, but there will be one that was the first one, which is the one you want to access anyway. And yes, allow yourself to see that it is there because you know it's there in your, in your heart. It doesn't matter at this stage what it is. At first, just allow yourself to understand that what you suspect to be true is probably true. It is true. And allow yourself to acknowledge that. And also allow yourself to see that you will get to it if you keep accessing your emotions. And what that does too, and start talking to God about that, about that, that there is this one event and you know that there is this one event and you would like to access it but you're afraid. Say what, you know, what you're feeling about it and you'll find that you'll access the event pretty rapidly. Now almost everyone that I've suggested this to has usually accessed the event in the following three months. So they've usually got to a real core emotion about something that's been a very traumatic and terrifying event in their childhood. In some cases it's been even an event like someone drowned and was resuscitated. Or you know, it could be an event like that as well, besides abuse. Um, sounds like I'm rattling again. So do you understand that it could be anything to do with something like that even, not just abuse, an abuse issue? Yeah, I'm just, um, it's really ready to come to it yeah. in the last month or so. I'm really, it's, in, you know, it's manifesting as bad indigestion, heartburn, and That's it. I'm overheating, and it's really wanting to come out. But, yeah. and, and I just, uh, you know, I'm a practitioner, I'm a counsellor myself, but I'm just really struggling with pulling this one out. It's yeah. just really sitting heavily. The, so the main thing at this point is now just to start telling yourself the truth. Yes, there is this event. Yes, I'm going to be able to do something about this event. 
we're going to get to the bottom of this event, you know, and whatever it is, you can actually handle. At the moment, you don't believe you will be able to, but, but if, with your relationship with God, you will be able to handle the event and the emotions surrounding the event. And it will actually change your law of attraction quite markedly once you release the emotion. And in fact, for anyone who's experienced childhood abuse or a childhood event that's been traumatic, when you release that event completely, your law of attraction will markedly change in lots of different areas. So there's a lot to look forward to in accessing the event too. Down the front here with the mic. Um, AJ, I seem to be one of these really numb supports people. No worries. <laughs> and um, it feels great to hear about all the ideas of anger because it seems like, yes, it is an access point in, but it's something very foreign to me. Yes. You know? <clears throat> um, although when I left here last night, I got a really bad headache. How many of you left with a bad headache yesterday? Quite a few would have, yeah. It's quite a few mm. left with bad headaches. Yeah, it was, it was so bad and I felt really nauseous and my eyes started, you know. And I know, I guess, that wasn't a, that was a, um, a chance to do something with it, but I actually got very frozen yeah. and all I could do was, like, be with the pain and yeah. keep still. That was it. that was my um, my usual way, I guess, of dealing with that. Yeah. And I'd really like to just start. You know, I just feel like I have no idea where to. Where I to start. hear I hear the knowledge of where to start, yeah. but I can't connect yeah. at all. So the issue is this feeling of numb. That's the feeling you currently feel, and. A friend of mine from, I think I've told this story a little before, but a friend of mine from Canada came over and that's the feeling he felt, numb. Anything, single situation. He was so numb, he's, he's, at the time he was 23 years of age, he'd never had a sexual experience in his entire life. He was numb, numb to all sexuality. He was numb to the emotions of others. If you started talking to him about the emotions, he would, start, he would just go straight into his intellect and start intellectualising everything. And uh, he's one of the 14, this man is Luke, Luke from the Bible. And the first thing he had to do was start connecting to you know, the fact that he was numb and then start looking at why he was choosing to be numb. Because being numb is a choice. So again, the first question you ask is, what am I afraid of? And then what he did was one other thing that was really helpful. For two hours each day, he tried to allow himself to be angry. Now at the start he didn't do a very good job of it. It took him three weeks of doing this before he started accessing his first underlying sad emotion. So after a period of three weeks of, of two hours in the morning, two hours at night, beating the hell out of this uh, rubber man that he had in front of him, and with boxing bag and bat and a baseball bat and all sorts of things, he eventually connected to anger within the first few days and then he stayed in an angry state, in this sort of numb, angry state, for nearly three weeks. And then he experienced his first underlying emotion. So if we're in a numb state, it's going to take effort to get to drill down. The pain that you experience is a result of the underlying emotion wanting to come up, but still the desire inside of yourself wanting to keep it down. Does that make sense? In the case of a headache, usually it's the underlying emotion of sadness wanting to come up and I'm wanting to keep it back down and that takes a lot of intellectual energy and it, takes, it just creates very big, and in fact migraines are, the, are a big sign of needing to cry or any headache in fact a big sign of needing to cry but not wanting to allow myself. So the second thing I would do is pray to God about why don't I want to allow myself to do it. So you start talking to God about that and ask God to give you assistance and you guys to give you assistance to work out why. And you'll find in doing that, over the next few weeks, some law of attraction events will occur showing you that you're afraid of something. And when you're afraid, so when you realise what you're afraid of, talk to God about that. 
uh, I'm not dealing with that because of this emotion or whatever it is that you're feeling. Does that make sense? So is numbness always afraid of something? And all layers that are go around the causal emotion, so remember I drew the causal emotion before, here's our causal emotion, all of the layers that go around the causal emotion are all the result of fear. Otherwise we'd experience that emotion. So they're all the result of fear. And remember what fear is. Fear is a false expectation appearing real to you. It's something that you think is really real. And honestly, in many cases, it has been real in the past. That's why we feel it's real. Right? Of course, when we connect to God, we find out that a lot of things we thought was real in the past are not actually real. But, but before that time, these events that occur. So, for instance, if I was three years of age and I got punished for being angry, then is punishment a real fear? Yes. Because when I was three, I did get punished for being angry. So any time I get angry, I'm going to feel afraid because I'm going to think that someone's going to punish me. So it's a real fear. It's not real anymore, but it is a real fear from the past, and that's the reason why we believe it. For many, many occasions, it is a real fear even of the future. So, like, Mary's had some emotions she's been working through of why open her heart to me when there's a high likelihood this time round I'm going to die as well? Well, the last time I did. And it was shortly after she opened her heart to me too. Like, only a year and a half after. And then I died. Like, so, so why open her heart to me now? There's a real threat of the future that that might happen. I remember as a sort of a 20 year old having a feeling of, you know, cloaking my heart, thinking that is never going to happen to me again. But then that must also have been, you know, it wouldn't have happened at 20, it would have happened earlier. Yeah. Exactly. And at 20 was your last straw. That was the last time that you were ever going to let your heart be open again. So go back to that event now. So it's a good way to trace back into, a, into emotion as well. But allow yourself to see that actually, you know, it, it gets back to that question that you had about vulnerability. Allow yourself to be vulnerable at least with God. And this is why our relationship with God can heal us completely. Our relationship with others has the potential to heal, but it also has the potential to harm. Because the other person can be in a harmful state. Does that make sense? So if you, if you picture it this way, that... Here's, here's you, right? here's some other people around you, they are going to be in different states of error. But God, who can connect to you, is not in a state of error. So God has no error. No error with love. God has no error. These people have error. If I interact with these people when I'm trying to heal myself, Obviously, while it's probably good for my law of attraction, there is also the potential of harm. Because these people are in error, I'm in error, there's a potential I'll harm them and there's a potential they'll harm me. But if I deal with every emotion, like this issue of being vulnerable, with God, there's no potential harm with God if I allow myself to be vulnerable. Can you see yeah. that? So if you can allow, you know that heart that you have that you wrapped up and said, no one's going to hurt me again when you were 20? If you can at least allow yourself to start talking with God about unwrapping your heart towards God. Rather than doing it with others first, start doing it with God and see what happens. And as, it, as that God's love enters you and softens you, you'll find you'll be able to start doing it with others. Does that make sense? Yes, and, and the only, and in my understanding, because I've had a go at this and I find it really difficult, accessing anger through beating things up. I mean, I did a, I had an attempt at it, but it was just like, you know, after ranting and raving and saying, how do I feel? I feel fine, you know? <laughs> yep. Nothing's when happening. you're in a numb state, which is the state that you've closed yourself down towards, you'll find that it's going to take more than one time to actually start accessing what's underneath it. You can't expect years and years of suppression to be undone in one little session trying to get to some anger. Is that the only way in to um, anger? Numb covers, usually numb covers fear. 
But in between, numb and fear might be anger. But maybe. But maybe not. You know, all of us have different personality. All of us have a different way that we we address things of what happened when we were little. There's a high likelihood that there will be anger in between. But there may not. There may be just some fears capping the sadness-based emotions. Right? But to be frank with you, for you to go into a state of rigidity when you were 20 with your heart, there's got to be some anger there. Does that make sense? So, so if you can take yourself back to that state, how you felt, the, even the anger you felt in that state, like why did you close down your heart? Why did you put this rigid sign on my heart saying no, no one's ever going to get in there again. There's got to be some anger based feelings related to that. Yeah. And someone's had their hand up some time and no. Let's go from Morgan just behind. situations I don't know where to take it back to and because of I am so young you know like do I have to take it like how far I have to take it back to and um, with yourself Morgan um, you know you've been in your anger with your biological mum for some time so so the step the next step you need to be able to take is to get deeper than the anger and allow yourself to feel the sadness of her rejection does that make sense? Like, and that's the thing you're choosing to not do. You, you, don't, want, you don't want to let yourself feel that powerless state of, of being rejected. So what's happening for yourself is you have this anger feeling inside of you towards your mum. You've experienced it a lot already. My, and my feeling is if you're, you're not, you need to allow yourself now to dig deeper but there's a reason why you go into anger rather than digging deeper, and that is that you feel so hurt, and you feel that, the, that the, it's going to be so pointless. She's never going to love you. So what's the point of releasing it? Now, the point of releasing it is that you will be free of it. In other words, it won't dictate to you your life anymore. That's, your, that's the point of releasing it. At the moment, because you feel this anger, it's like her life is still affecting your life, how she feels about you is still affecting you. Can you, you see that? Whereas when you get below and you actually release the grief, how she feels about you will no longer affect you. And when that occurs, you won't feel angry with her anymore, but you probably won't have a relationship with her either, but you won't feel angry with her and you won't feel sad anymore about it. The reason why you're getting into the anger still is because you do not want to feel that it's that you'll never have a relationship with her. And but that that's probably the truth for some time to come. Until she works through her emotions. Does that make sense? And that's the emotion you're avoiding. What you 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 are hoping still, there's a there's a spark of hope in you still that mum is going to love me. She's gonna work out she's done the wrong thing and she's going to love me. Does that make sense? And that's why you're getting angry, because there's a spark of hope that you keep hoping from you, you keep hoping, and she doesn't show that back to you, and so you get angry with her for not showing it back. But what that's covering is just this deep feeling of grief. My mother does not love me. And right at the moment, your mother does not love you. And that's the emotion you need to let yourself feel. And you're allowed to feel that, because she does not love you. Down the track, she may work out, you know, that she'd be very regretful about that at some point and start to love you. But at the moment, that's the feeling. She does not love you. Yeah. Right up the back. Okay. Hi, Morgan. Look, I'm just wondering, do you believe that um, serious illness is actually manifested as an emotion? Um, other way around. Emotions manifest, emotions that are denied manifest serious illnesses. 
Okay, so in saying that, because I I have cancer, yep. and medicine has given me no hope. That's right. And I actually, you know, I'm on the path to do whatever I can because I have two small children, so I'm very determined. Yep. Um, and I just wanted to know how do you actually go about? Because I've been with obviously got you know a series of emotions along the way and two years ago we lost our son so it was a hospital error and that sort of thing so I've obviously manifested that as well and I just want to know is it possible I guess I'm looking for it's possible to cure your cancer with by dealing with your emotions the, the big issue with cancer is that there is already a lot of emotional suppression to create the cancer mm -hmm. So, do you mind me asking where the cancer is? No, cervix. Cervix? Yes, yeah, spread. Okay. The issue that you're facing is that you have some very, very deep um, anger and grief with, with, this, with sexuality and with sex itself. And that's what's affecting cancer in that, in that region for you. The, if I can go through what cancer is, so, um, I'll write it so you can see it at the back. So cancer, if we put that in brackets, it's an illness. It's a life-threatening illness, right? Underneath cancer, so cancer is resulted from, from suppression. We're suppressing something emotionally. The suppression will be suppression of some kind of emotion. Now, usually it is the suppression of anger. Right? Now, under the anger, there is usually a fear and under the fear there is usually the real emotion which is usually going to be a grief uh, based emotion and usually with cancers there is also related emotions of shame, self shame, self it's like feeling bad about yourself. Now where you get the cancer depends upon what emotion is being suppressed. So, for example, if I've, got, if I've got cancer in a breast, then it would depend on whether it started in the left breast or the right breast as to what emotion I'm suppressing. It, there'll be an over-nurturing thing that I'm trying to do, which is resulted about wanting to get love from that particular... If it's the left side, it'll be from the female. If the right side, it'll be from the male. If I have cancer in the lungs, it will be some deep sadness that's occurred that I've suppressed, and this is why many smokers get lung cancer, because they, they smoke to suppress deep sadness that they don't want to feel, and then they cover that with a lot of deep anger about what they're sad about, and then, then of course that creates the cancer in the lungs. For, for many men there will be a prostate cancer. Prostate cancer is related, is very similar to cervical, cervical cancer in a woman. Prostate cancer for men is very similar, in that it's to do with the opposite gender. It's to do with some deep grief, grieving to do, that's covered then by some fear and covered by some anger about the opposite gender and about sex in, with the opposite gender. In each case, usually all of these things are based around the underlying grief is related to usually childhood events. So there'll be things that have happened in your childhood related to sexuality <coughs> that have that you yet have grieved, that you need to allow yourself to grieve, but because they are powerful events, you've got some fear about grieving them, and you're worried about that, and so then that's created the anger, and then because you don't allow the anger to be there, you've suppressed the anger, and that then creates the body pain. Does that make sense as to how it's created? Mm -hmm. So, the way to work through it is firstly to step into the anger that you feel about sex and sexuality and the opposite sex, then, then ask yourself questions about what you're afraid of, and then eventually you'll get down, and you can do this quite rapidly, get down into the grief that you feel of some events, and I think you're aware of some of the events that happened in your childhood that may have caused you to have this feeling regarding sexuality that you have. Now, my, there's nothing that's triggering your mind? No, that's definitely not. How does your mother feel about men? What she loves them, as far as I know. What does she do? Job-wise, or...? No, for men. 
for men. You um, say your mum loves men. Well, she's married to my dad and so I've been very happily married for yeah. a very long time. And who is the primary carer in the relationship, do you feel? Probably dad. Okay, so what, what emotion does your mum have towards your dad? Um, so does dad do everything mum wants? Yeah, control, so he's control. So mum is the controlling person in the relationship? Yes. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. So you would have grown up in this family environment where your mother is the controlling person in the relationship. Can you see, can you see why she would want to control a man? So she doesn't want to be open and vulnerable and have an equal relationship with a man. She tells herself she does, but she doesn't. She wants to have a controlling, the controlling relationship. So she has some emotions of being special, you know, and the man makes her feel special and wanted and all those kind of emotions. Mm -hmm. right. so, so there must be an emotion inside of your mother of some deep anger towards men to cause her to want to control men to get exactly what she wants. Now, can you see anything related to your relationship with men in there? Well, I guess I can be a bit of a control group, but you okay. don't have to be honest. Okay, so there's, so there's feelings you want from men, and you feel men should give you those feelings. And that is where, that's the anger level that you're experiencing. There's a lot of anger in that, aren't you, that you're unaware of, that you've suppressed, because your mother has suppressed it in herself. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And how did your father treat you? Did he, he treated you like, sort of like a princess? Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so that's caused you to feel what about men? That men should treat me like, treat me like a princess. <laughs> exactly. And you feel totally justified with that emotion at the moment. But it's not an actually loving emotion. Mm -hmm. So the key is to start experimenting a little with this emotion and start working through how, how forceful you feel about that inside of yourself and why that's the case. Because th this is the cause of the cancer. There is a, there's grief surrounding that issue, surrounding your mum as well in a connection. And there's also a connection with a spirit who's connected with you, who has the same grief in herself. So there's a, do you, I don't know if you believe in spirits or not? Yeah, like a, like a Grandmother spirit? Uh, this is a spirit who has, has the same kind of feelings you have towards men. And this spirit also passed with cancer. My grandmother. Yep. Okay, so your grandmother is actually affecting your cancer at the moment as well. I had a dream about that about three months ago. Yep. So. Yeah, so, so it's the combination of your own emotion, which has been a long term running emotion in the women's side of your family, your mother's family. And, and that long-term running emotion, and actually it's also been in the father's side of your family with the women in his family as well. And because of this long-term emotion, you have that emotion in you, and your grandmother is very connected with you, she feels a strong rapport with you, but she, she actually, I believe she might have even passed with the same problem, did she, or? Well, she had a lung cancer. Lung cancer. But, um, yeah. I guess I don't know what type of cancer it was in terms of cell wise when you're talking about cancer, but it does normally appear in the lung, never in the cervix. Yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. there is some really deep feelings you need to work through about that, and it's, and it's a family based generational feeling that's been impressed. And, and the core of it is this emotion you have that men should treat me like a princess. So if you can start allowing yourself to connect to that emotionally, you'll start connecting with why. One of the feelings you have that you feel like is, well, yes, of course they should. <laughs> it's the, one of the feelings I can feel back when I say those words. Right? Yeah. And then allow yourself to go, well, why should they? Like, why should they treat you any different than you treat them? Mm -hmm. Why should they, like, sure, treat a woman like a princess, but does that mean you've got to treat him like a prince? Mm -hmm. Does your mother treat your father like a prince? Or is it just your father treating your mother like a princess? Can, so can you see there's some imbalance in their relationship there? Mm -hmm. uh, which obviously is a multi-generational family thing that has been impressed upon yourself. Now, it is definitely related to sex and sexuality, this issue, coming from generationally through your families. 
So you probably, if you ask your mum about her mother and her grandmother, you may find that there's some sexual injuries um, that they've had while they're on Earth um, related to this emotion being within in you girls now, your mum and yourself. Does that make sense? Now, if you allow yourself to connect to those things, you'll find you'll be able to get to the cause of the cancer. The problem with cancer illnesses is that we, we don't like looking at ourselves very much because we think, well, you know, what, what I've found is that many people with cancers that I've been talking to don't want to get into the emotion of how dominating and domineering they can be. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And that's something inside of yourself to just be aware of. Is, is if you can allow yourself to feel that controlling part of you, because it's that controlling part of you which is driven by some of these emotions and a core emotion towards men, that controlling part of you is actually generating your cancer as well. And it's about releasing that. And that will help you work through the issue. Okay. Is that... Thank you. I can't really say too much more without having yeah, a problem. Yeah, sure. So, Thank you very yeah. much. And Linda, thanks. Lisa, sorry. Hi, it's just about this girl that was just talking. Yeah. Why is the disease showing up in her and not her mother when the emotion's coming from her mum? Because quite often the children are dying, but the parents are living. Um, the us life. Usually it's because the ch child is more sensitive emotionally than the parent. Um, so um, there is also things to do with the child's personality that they're involved with it as well. And then there is also the combination of emotions coming from both lineages being oppressed. And then there's also the added issue of spirit attachment. So, so the truth probably is that the grandmother is not that attached to the mother, but more attached to the granddaughter. That's one issue. So, so what, I'm, what I'm basically saying is the reason why it happens in one generation and not another, is that there are so many a variety of factors that actually make it different for the child and for the parent. Now, in, in your family's case, there is, on both lineages, this injury exists. The reason why your father, for example, is placating the woman all the time and treating the woman like a princess to often his own detriment is because he was taught to do that by his own, his own parents and what happened in their relationship. Does that make sense? So you, it's sort of like, if you can think of it down, there's the mother side of the family coming down towards you, and then there's the father side of the family coming down towards you, and both of them had the same emotions, so now the, those emotions are going to sort of like double up in you. Does that make sense? Because they're unhealed. So there's a lot of variety of factors which will occur, which will create the problem in the child when the mother or the father may not necessarily have had it. I've seen many cases where the child dies of cancer and then later on, 20 years later, the parents finish up dying of the same form of cancer. And the reason why that happens is because the child has died because there's this concentration of emotions from both the male and female lineages in the child, but the emotions still existed to a lesser extent in the parents. And so that's uh, happened in times as well where we, we find that occurring. And this is also why most cancers have a higher occurrence in certain like family lines. Because it's actually the emotions in those family lines that generate the disease. Does that make sense? And um, just straight across. Um, not long ago, we lost a son to cancer. Yep. How old was he? 43. Yep. And um, what form of cancer do you mind me asking? Um, in the groin or, or liver. It started in the groin and then it moved on into other areas. Right. So it was testicular, testicular cancer or no. prostate cancer, but no, just in the groin, in the muscle area yes, of the groin. That area. Okay, in the lymph areas of the groin or? Um, yes, with a large lump. And which side of the body? Can you remember? I'm sorry I'm asking you all these things. I know you're still grieving. The right hand side. Right, right hand side. That's better than I do. Um, my question is to do with anger. Yep. Um, it took him about a year to, to die, but when, I, when we were aware that he, he was going to die, yep. 
um, I'd been, we'd been praying to God and doing all those things. Yep. I got very, very angry. And yep. uh, I, I raged at God and I swore at him and I beat, I did all those things that uh, I guess I was supposed to do. Um, he died and after he died, there was no anger to God. Sort of a sense of peace, but yeah. there's a uh, great sense of grief, which is very, very hard to control. Yeah. And what I was wondering if it'd be easy to control that uh, crying, which is the main thing that we can't, we can't think of the boy without crying. Yeah. Whether addressing maybe anger I still have in me might improve that situation. Um. I feel you addressed a lot of the anger you had when, during the situation. The issue that you're facing now, I believe, is, is the grief. And if I can just make some notes about your grief, if you like. The, the issue with grief, particularly with losing children, um, When we're grieving, there's a number of truths that we're not yet facing at an emotional level, that we don't yet believe in our heart. And, and what we need to do is allow ourselves to actually work through releasing the error through our grief until once we release the error through our grief, we'll eventually get to those truths. So if I could describe some of the truths, for example. For instance, one truth is, your son is still alive. Another truth is that he's probably enjoying himself a bit more now that he's passed than he was when he was here on Earth, uh, riddled with the cancer. Another truth is that um, he has an eternal existence as do yourself. Now these are really basic, what I would call down the bottom here, I'll write them as core divine truths. So these are truths, these are truths. The reason why we grieve is because we do not understand at the emotional level the truth. Now. The reason why we do that is because there are lots of other emotions in between getting to this place from and this place. And this place is actually, the grief is the mechanism by which we can accept truth. Do you understand what I mean by that? It's through our grief that these core truths will eventually become a part of you. And when they become a part of you, you will, you will actually get to a point where you're no longer grieving and you'll know in your heart these truths to be true. And so you'll be able to think of your son with joy and happiness and not with grief. Right? So the grief is the tool by which you will eventually accept these truths. Now at the moment for yourself, you're trying to control the extent of the grief. The grief is actually, and this is going to be some, some of the things I might say now might sound a little cruel, but I'll be, I want to be straight with you about them. The grief is actually not about the loss of your son. The grief is about what losing your son means to you. Can you see there's a difference between the two? There's, in other words, you, losing your son has triggered inside of you grieving based emotions related to your own childhood in some way and things that you lost during this period of time of your growing up and into your adult life. And what this grief is doing is triggering those events and that's why as soon as you think of your son, what's the next thing you think of? There's, a, there's something you think of next. One thing I, I did mention, <coughs> I should that towards the end, I, uh, <coughs> I was just so threatened, not threatened, so uh, 
I'm upset by the fact that it should have been me. I come from a I have history of both sides of my family dying of cancer. Yes. And I've got all the outward signs that I should have it, and he didn't. There's a very, very strong personal feeling of guilt in you that it should have been you. And in fact, that emotion covers over some very, very strong childhood events where you were blamed for lots of things in your life. And in fact, your grief is actually helping you access this guilt and then accessing, I won't write down what those emotions are because you will need to allow yourself to discover them in your childhood. But that's what's actually happening. And so your son's death has triggered in you all these terrible feelings of guilt that you have about it, about yourself and your life and how it should have been you who passed. And that's why the grieving is taking a while to work your way through. The key for you to do it is to allow yourself now to go into what you feel guilty about. And talk to God now about those things. What, what is it that you feel guilty about? You feel guilty about living on earth. He's not here anymore. Feel guilty about it. He had a family, I gather. And you feel guilty about he had children too, I gather. And uh, you feel guilty about what's happened to the family, the children. There's, and if it happened to you, you feel that none of those things would have happened to them. And so there's a lot of feelings in there where you're taking on the blame and that comes from a lot of things from your childhood and one of those where, where you were blamed for that you need to allow yourself to actually work your way through. When you work your way through that, you will no longer have this terrible feeling of guilt when you think of your son's passing and you'll actually then be able to grieve the actual loss of your son himself in the sense of your relationship, what you feel you've lost your relationship. And once you do that, you'll get to some core truths that actually your son's around you all the time and he's quite fine now, he's not physically ill and you know he can see what's going on with his family, he can see what's going on with you, that he, that he loves you and cares about you, you'll start feeling all those truths inside of you and so when you think of him he'll often be present and you'll feel him present and at some time in the future you may even finish up talking to him um, after you've worked your way through those emotions. Does that make sense? At the moment, it's going to be very difficult for you even to hear him or talk with him because as soon as you even speak his name, this process happens inside of you. So allow yourself to actually go through the process into the emotion of it and you'll get to the core of it, which will all be revolving around how much you were blamed and how much you took the blame as a result of being blamed in your childhood life and coming into your adult life. And does that feel, you can feel some of the things in amongst that? Um, and then you'll be, when you grieve, you actually, you actually, the grief will feel, you'll feel a sense of peace of it. And once you get to that stage, you'll also understand the truth at the heart level. So rather than it just being an idea that your son's alive, you will feel it in your heart, rather than it just being an idea that you can communicate to him. Whenever you want to talk to him, you'll just open your mouth and talk to him. Do you know what I mean? And you'll feel that his reflection of emotion, if not anything else. And you may actually feel at some point other things from him as well. You may even hear his voice at some point and know that everything's fine with him. Um, Last year, you said to write down your fears, and I wrote down my fears, and some of those fears I've been dealing with, and healing, and my law of attraction has been changing. Mm -hmm. But lately, I've been wanting to heal the fear of the love of God. Yeah. And today, I've had memories of, I was brought up a Catholic, and in church, big statue, on the cross, Jesus on the cross, plaster, drips of blood, blood and everything, yeah. and feeling faint, 
um, and I'm feeling faint now and dizzy. Yeah. And the nun said that every time I was a naughty little girl, I nailed Jesus to the cross and I made him feel more pain. Yeah. And I used to feel faint in mass and in school. And I actually fainted. And when I was naughty, the devil was going to get me and all that sort of stuff. So I know that this fear of the love of God is that stuff. And the blockage between me and the love of God. Yeah. And I want to heal it. Yeah. It's a terrible thing that you get told. Uh, that, that being told that that my death was made more torturous by your actions. Yeah, so it's my fault. Is a major form of control that uh, churches have used over children in particular. It's a terrible thing to say to somebody, isn't it? Little children of five, six, seven, eight. Yeah. Well, let's, let's look at how to deal with it. If you could think of a scale where, I'd, I'd call this your fear scale, down the bottom here, I'll call it the opposite to fear is truth. So, the problem with fears is they all enter us emotionally. So, remember that fear and truth are not just intellectual concepts. They are actually, together they are emotions. So that means that every single fear that entered me, I'm not going to be able to deal with it by just saying the fear. I'm actually going to have to deal with it by feeling the fear. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So your fear in this case was that my life, my death actually, was made more torturous by you sinning. Yes. That's the yes. implication that they, that they gave to you. That is not the truth. Yes. You know here that's not yes. the truth. So here you know the truth is that actually I only die because of, the, well, as I said yesterday, because of money, lots of it. Basically, that's the only reason why I die, right? And because of the conflict between truth and error. That's the only reason why I die. But here you know that. Yep. But here you don't feel that. That's right. So the only way to get to feel that here is to actually feel the fears that you have leaving you. So, what were you told? That I, I caused you pain. So, how do you spell cream? K A R I S M A. Charisma? Caused Jesus pain. And it was torture. Torture. By Sinning. Now, by the way, you could replace me with anybody here. So a lot of times, one of the emotions that we all have is that we're afraid of hurting other people. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. most of us have that. So if your mother, when you were young, told you, you're hurting me when you feel that. You hurt me when you did that. It's the same emotion. Does that make sense? It's the same kind of emotion, but directed at your mother, not God. So this emotion exists in the majority of us because most of the times our parents have taught us things like you're hurting me when you do this or you're causing me more pain or don't you realise how bad you're making my life when you say that or, and so forth. These kind of emotions are often projected at us. You will need to feel that you did do that because that's what you feel inside of you to release it. Does that make sense? So let yourself feel that. So rather than fighting the belief that it occurred, go into the childhood feeling that that's what you did. Do you follow me? Yeah. Now, you know here it's not true, but that's immaterial. You will know here it's not true when you release from yourself emotionally that you did that. Does that make sense? And so, so you're going to have to have a good cry about the fact that you believe you caused me pain. Now, if, if, I, if I just let you do that, and those of you who have this 
same feeling with your mother or your father, let yourself believe it to be true in this instance and let yourself feel it. Does that make sense? Because the truth is in your heart, you believe it to be true. So you let yourself believe it to be true and feel it. When you feel it fully and pray to God about that, what will happen is you'll come out the other end of that feeling, releasing it, and you'll no longer believe it. Does that make sense? Uh, yes. uh, microphone. Thanks, Thanks Charisma. Uh, yes. Is the mic on or? No. <laughs> and I'd throw my arms around and sort of get quite angry, and my I'd either storm out of the door, and I'd stub my toe. Or so when you were a young child, you used to have tantrums. Yeah, when I was a young child, I'd have tantrums, and I'd sort of get into a stage where I'd sort of scr uh, scream and yell, and sort of shake as well. And um, when I tried to leave or something, I'd stub my toe or hit my elbow, and my mother would say to me, "Ha ha, see the devil got you back." from those actions, and yeah. that's just something feeling from that level. Yeah, exactly. These are all messages that our parents give us, and, and in fact, religions also do the same thing. They give us to control us, and unfortunately, they enter us emotionally. So, so this is one reason why you would have some fear about the devil. So even though you might not even believe in a devil here in your mind, the emotion in, as a child will be that the devil got you back every time you were bad. Yeah, and so you have this feeling in you of constantly being on the lookout for the devil sort of thing, getting you back if you were to do a bad thing. Yeah, yeah. which led to sort of suppressing emotions because when I sort of let it out, something... So now you suppress the emotions because, because you think if you let them out, the devil's going to get you. Yeah, it didn't have to be a living person to do that. Exactly. Yeah, no, no living person is going to punish you, but somebody yeah. from the spirit world will, which for many children is actually scarier. Um, so many, many parents go through this, pro this, uh, this problem of control with their children and so they come up and they dream up many forms of how to control their children, including like, I can see you even when I'm not here. You know? And if they have a spirit with them, that is actually true. So if a, if a parent has a spirit telling them what the child's done, right, then the parent could say to the child, I can see you even when you're, I'm not here. You make sure you do the right thing, because if you do the wrong thing, I'll know. And I've had, I've had people that I've met who have had parents like this, who have come back and said, you did this and you did that and you did this, didn't you? And give them a good belt for all the things they did when the parent wasn't even there. But the parent knows they did those things because of a spirit telling them. And, and that just creates this huge terror in this child, like they can't, they feel controlled even when the parent's not there. And so there's adult children that are now working through their emotions who feel like their parents, who are now 70 or 80, are still controlling them because of this emotion in them. So these are really damaging emotions to work through. Well, just what we'll do now, is, it's five past three, so what we'll do now is have a break. For a... All right, how's everyone doing? Good. Feeling a bit better than yesterday? Yes. Has everyone noticed that the energy is a bit better than yesterday? Yes. Uh, still, still a bit of resistance today, but uh, energy a bit better than yesterday, which is really, really good. The, the um, main issues yesterday were this deep resistance to thinking that anybody's angry, <laughs> and then this deep resistance to actually allowing it to be uh, discussed or, or triggered. And so yesterday there was this really oppressive uh, load. And then there were quite a few spirits here yesterday. Uh, when I say quite a few, I think it was close to a million spirits here yesterday. And, and, uh, and they, they were, many of them were brought here by celestial spirits who, because of their angry state, and these spirits, the celestial spirits, thought that the spirits would ben benefit from the information. And, and through the night, I had the feeling that the majority of them did benefit from the information. When I went home last night, I felt quite disappointed <laughs> about yesterday because of the feeling that I didn't do a good job yesterday and, um, and didn't uh, confront perhaps your anger more than I did. Um, but uh, after my sleep last night, um, 
I realised that a lot of the spirits who were here were definitely assisted. So I was pretty happy about that uh, when I woke up this morning. Yeah, so. And with regard to this, this anger discussion, it is, it is a difficult thing. And it's a, it's a bit scary thing that most people find. Because, you know, we're, we're so focused on trying to keep everything at an equilibrium, you know, everything nice and safe and secure. And when we start talking about anger, there's so many competing emotions in uh, the, even the discussion. One of the competing emotions is, well, what if I get into anger and I kill somebody? You know, that a lot of people feel that there's that much rage inside of themselves that if they let themselves start experiencing it, they're going to do some major damage to people. Others feel like, well, no, I don't want to be perceived as being angry. You know, what? I, me angry? No, no, I'm this loving, nice, calm, you know, spiritual person that I've been all my life, sort of thing. And they don't want to conceive that perhaps there's some anger inside of themselves that's really affecting their life. And, and then others uh, understand that yes, the anger is a gateway into what's underneath and they do not want to go underneath. Like, and so many of us have this feeling, I do not want to go underneath. What, what's AJ doing to me? He's trying to get me underneath and I don't want to go underneath. And this is why a lot of the times, many of us feel really buoyant after I have a discussion about love or natural love or something that's a little more external to myself, right? So a lot of us come away from that kind of discussion feeling really enthused and buoyant and you know, quite encouraged and so forth and walk away sort of on cloud nine type of feeling. And some of you have felt that after a group, right, for different groups. And then when we have a discussion about fear or we have a discussion about anger, Everybody goes into this <laughs> closed down, <laughs> shut down state. And when we walk away at night, we go away with a headache instead of feeling good, you know? And the reason why is because we're wanting to keep down the truth about it inside of ourselves. So my suggestion is allow yourself even a bit further just to open up and open up and allow the fact that there is some anger in there and allow the fact of what that's about to start coming into your consciousness because it's that work that's going to bring you closer to God and also closer to other people in your life. So, for example, if you have anger specifically directed towards the opposite sex, then obviously that's going to keep you at a distance between yourself and the opposite sex. Now, if you have a heterosexual type of relationship, then obviously it's keeping distance between you and your partner if you have injuries towards the opposite sex. So, you know, allow yourself to work through those injuries and allow yourself to get closer. Because if we don't face these things, we'll never experience the bliss that's possible to experience. So allow yourself to dig deep into those emotions. Um, I was wondering, Mary, whether you want to just join me and talk about some of the, your emotions about the opposite sex. <laughs> She's just in the middle of the process. You don't have to. <laughs> what I'd like to do from now on, so after Mary is finished, we'll invite others to come up and talk about some of their feelings about things too. So, far away from Well, remember we were mentioning a few things about anger that you felt. Um, yep. Was it last night or this morning? Mm. Um. I think I started saying some stuff yesterday about um, recognising that I was so angry at men in my life. And um, some of that was triggered when I met AJ as well. And I um, realised that that's related to some first century memories that um, I still find hard to talk about publicly. So um, that's good trigger for me today. Um, so when I first met AJ, the first emotion that I connected to was anger. Um, and I think he was relating yesterday about four days into our trip together, I, I hit this huge grief, rage emotion that seemed to come out of nowhere. And when I wrote about it in my journal, it was a very strange experience because all of these feelings were coming up in me that I didn't understand. But the predominant theme was that he had left me and abandoned me and I was very, very angry about that. Um, and I felt that I couldn't trust him again because that would 
be what would happen again. And that's been an emotion that has been pretty, I've been working through for about a year now. Um, it's a big one. And as I get further down into it, um, something that I've been working through, say, in the, in the last couple of months, is the feeling that AJ can't understand the pain that I've gone through. Um, and he still doesn't understand the pain that I've gone through. Uh, and I sort of had this realisation yesterday that that was actually almost a cap. That's a huge emotion in me, so it's hard to feel that it's a cap, but it actually is a cap for... It's um, an avoidance of feeling just the deep grief and pain that I did feel at that time that I still feel connected to. Um, and I think the reason we sort of thought it would be good to talk about today is that I do... Um, see that in other women, there's this real anger that men don't understand us um, and it may not come out as a rate, it's more of an attitude that I feel is quite an angry attitude that a lot of women have. Um, but it is actually an avoidance of the deeper grief that we have about how we feel men have treated us. So it's like sometimes these emotions, like Mary just pointed out, the emotion of men, I'm not understood by you. So let's say you're in a partner, you're, you're in a relationship with your partner and you're a woman and you feel like the man doesn't understand you. And so then there's this temptation to project a lot of anger at him every time he doesn't understand you. So rather than doing that, see that as just a cap over an emotion of I'm not understood by men. And underneath that is the core emotion that men just like, oh, that, that that I've got to feel, and that is, nobody can understand me, is the core emotion underneath that. And no one can understand me because I'm a woman. I feel hurt, yeah, because of men's actions, that kind of thing. Yeah. So al allow yourself to dig deeper into it, rather than just projecting that surface layer uh, towards your partner. Because if you think about it, or us women, a lot of us have that belief. We don't even think that's anger, we just, that's a belief. Men don't, just don't understand us women, but I'm telling you that's anger. <laughs> so if you have that belief, you're angry at men. So but it's actually not true either. Yeah. This so, man understands. <laughs> <laughs> so so the, this really, like, you know, the men are from Mars, women from Venus type thinking is uh, like, while it's gained a lot of popularity uh, because of the misunderstanding between the sexes, the truth is, the way God designed us is that we're one soul together. So how can we, in the end, ever misunderstand the other? So once we actually break down, so once I break down all the barriers inside of me towards feeling like feeling misunderstood and also misunderstanding, and once Mary breaks down the same barriers, then of course we'll completely understand each other. In fact, so completely that Mary's emotion, as she's feeling it, will pass through me. And my emotion, as I'm feeling it, will pass through Mary. We won't even have to open our mouth to say what the emotion is. The other person will be automatically feeling it. Yeah. Uh, if you think about it even energetically, this belief that men don't understand me is a very much uh, pushing away sort of a thing. Whereas if I'm in my grief of feeling misunderstood, it's much more allowing and you create a different energy between the two of you. Yeah. So, so if I'm focused on allowing all of my emotion to be present within me and feeling all of my emotion, and Mary is focusing on the same thing with herself, then obviously now emotion can actually go between us and it actually creates more understanding. Like she will then understand me because she can feel my emotion. I'll be able to understand her because I can feel her emotion. Does that make sense? The I, all misunderstanding between the sexes is all because we've got blockages to letting ourselves feel their emotion, or we've got blockages to feeling our own emotion, or we've got blockages to allowing them feel our emotion. Right? And all of the misunderstandings that occur are because these blockages are in the way for Mary to feel my stuff and me to feel Mary's stuff. When I feel Mary's stuff and my own, and Mary feels her own stuff and, and my stuff, we have complete understanding in the relationship. Com complete knowing, without opening your mouth, 
what emotion we're going through at every particular instance. And that's what it will mean in the end to be closely unioned as soul halves into a soul, into a complete soul. Another thing, like under my anger, I realised I had a lot of fear. I think you mentioned it earlier about um, feeling that I'll be vulnerable and then I'll lose this man. Um, and that will be, that will hurt worse than if I don't open my heart. And I do think a lot of women have that feeling as well. Um, and I have realised that it's actually, it's cutting off your nose to spot your face or something because um, I'm keeping him at a distance all of the time because I'm very afraid of losing the, the potential love, loving connection. But in the end, he's at a distance anyway and we kind of make each other miserable from the distance. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Where, so I'm sort of preventing a potential experience of pure joy and happiness um, for fear of losing it. So can you see a lot of times we're worried about future events and the fear of a future event creates the anger in the presence. Like we're afraid in the future that I'll lose it and if I lose it in the future then what's the point of opening out now? I might as well give up now rather than losing that in the future. So imagine what it feels like for you to be in a beautiful loving relationship and then your partner die. There are going to be some emotions about that, isn't there? If we're not yet in an abundant condition, that'll be there'll be some emotions there, right? And so, so the key for me is to again just allow all of these feelings pass through me. Mary does the same thing, rather than focusing on what may happen in the future. The irony is, is once I release these emotions anyway, what will happen in the future will be a lot better than what will happen if I hold on to these emotions right now. Because while I'm still in grief, I can't actually love properly anyway. And, and while you're in anger, you can't love properly either. And while you're in fear, you can't love properly either. Ten on the back with the mic. Yeah. Tom. Um, I've been having a problem with just trying to get into the fear of having a relationship with a man again. I know there's probably a lot of anger towards men still. The other day I kept on saying, I just want someone to love me, I just want someone to love me. And then all of a sudden I realised, no I don't, because I've still got this anger and this fear. And, and can but, I just stop you for a moment? Think about the reciprocal. You didn't say, I want to love someone. Well that's the other thing that came to me this morning. I had a huge release even before I came today. And I was saying, I just want somebody to love me. And then I turned it around and said, I want someone I can give my love to and not be rejected. So that was huge for me. And then I went in and realised that God was already there doing that for me. So that was wonderful. But what I wanted to ask was, when you say about passing through you, the emotion passing through you, do you mean not taking it personally? Like sort of trying not to take it personally? Every, every emotion is personal. Yeah, well that's what I was sort of... So yeah. You mean once you've sort of had one with God, it will pass through you? No, I'm saying, I'm saying even for a child, the emotion passes through them. So for example, you look at a child, when a child starts crying, if you just let, let it cry, it cries for as long as it needs to cry and then stops. And after that, it gets up and walks around as if nothing had happened. You notice that with children? Like they have their big cry or their big tantrum or whatever it is they're having at that moment and then they get up straight afterwards almost as if nothing has actually just happened. So when an emotion fully passes through you, there's nothing left stored inside of you of that particular emotion at that moment. So if I'm letting all emotion pass through me, I'm experiencing all emotion as it's passing through me when it's finished passing through me, it's not something that I've stored inside of me. Okay, can I just, just one other thing. Um, when you were talking about women not understanding men, I've actually turned that around and it seems to be that I don't understand men. You know, I'm not worried about me and under, them not understanding me. I'm just, I don't understand their thinking at the moment. Uh, and the other thing is, over probably three or four years, I keep having this recurring dream, uh, being very anxious about 
people understanding me? You know, why don't you understand me? Why don't you let me just say what I need to say? And it, it's like I end up screaming because I don't feel like I'm being understood. So is that all part of the relationship thing and the anger thing? Yeah, your statement that I don't understand men, like it's, it's very blanket though. There, there, there's obviously specific men in your life and there's specific male relationships in the past. So if you can make it more personal, because when we just say, oh, who, who understands men, it kind of it's a, gets us away from lots there of stuff. There is a man in my life, and uh, well, I'd like him in my life, and I think he's my soulmate, but I'm getting mi mixed messages. messages. I'm, 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 I have so much grief over not being with this man. Every time I think about it, I cry. So I think there's got to be something there, but um, it's... I don't understand where he's coming from, and I, I'm and trying speaking. to... Yes, um, instead of trying to understand where he's coming from, just focus on what, what is being triggered in you right now. Because it is your law of attraction, even if he's your soulmate. So just try and go into, okay, mixed messages, how does that make me? Just go, and you're really good at that, go into all of that, and, and just... Don't try and kind of put him in a box yet or understand exactly what's happening with him. And, and this is a main problem that many have, not only with their husbands, wives or partners, but also with parents. A lot of times we don't allow ourselves to feel our emotion because we're so busy trying to understand the other person's emotion and why they did what they did. Forget about why they're doing what they're doing. Forget about why they did what they did. Forget about why, what you think they're going to do in the future and just focus on what am I feeling about what's happening with me right now in this relationship? What, what are my feelings? And that's a classic tool I used to use to get myself out of my emotions. To try and understand where the other person's coming from, have compassion for that, oh well, that's just where they're at. And I just skipped over a whole load of emotion of how I felt about the treatment of me. Yeah. I think I'm just feeling like you. If I don't do it quick enough, he's going to be gone. Yeah. You know? Um, just if, one if he's more. your soulmate, yeah, know, I guess, that's yeah, not going to happen. Yeah, I know, but that, that's kind of... Yeah. I, I understand mm. that feeling. Like just one more thing. Because I am a single woman and I don't have a man in my life and I mean, I love the way the two of you bounce each, things off each other and you've got each other to sort of help along. As a single person, male or female, I share house with Nada. Can we still... It's kind of like being in a relationship because we're sharing a house. If, the, if things trigger us, we should be talking to each other. But will that help a intimate relationship in the long run as well? Any emotional work that you do will help an intimate relationship in the long run, definitely. And you're right. Um, you know, the fact that you're living with another person is your law of attraction. So obviously there's something for you to learn in that interaction. And if both of you are in the state where you're both working through your emotions, that can be a very powerful interaction in both working through the information. In the end, though, you still need to take personal responsibility for your own responses and talk to, you know, in the end, the most powerful development that you will ever do is the development you do in your relationship with God. Because as you heal things, see, I keep saying this to everyone, but God's not damaged. So if I'm not feeling love from God right now, it's not because God's not trying to give it. It's because I've got a blockage to receiving it. Does that make sense? And if I heal that blockage to receiving it, I'll instantly at that moment feel the love coming from God. Now God's not damaged in receiving love either. So when I have a feeling of love towards God, God instantly feels that. And I will notice that... So, like. So instead of having this feeling, I'm trying to love someone, I'm trying to love someone, and they're not letting themselves feel loved, you won't feel that with God. So if you're not feeling that God feels you love God, then there's another problem inside of yourself. You know what I mean? And because God's not damaged in giving and receiving love, then if I'm not receiving from God or not giving to God, it's all my own stuff. And that's the beauty of that relationship. If you focus on that relationship first in developing love, what will happen is every other relationship will be greatly assisted by that. But the law of attraction certainly has brought you into a living situation with another woman. 
So if that's the case, then there's, there's things that as a woman you need to heal that each of you probably have opposites or some kind of sympathetic attraction for that if you work your way through your issues or your annoyances or your different anger you might feel with each other or different things that happen between each other, that will certainly go towards healing yourself. And healing yourself is one of the biggest things that needs to occur in any relationship with the opposite sex. So. Okay, one, one more very quick thing. It's a really, really good thing. Yeah. Uh, I was banging and thrashing in the garage this morning and I was yelling and I was crying and I was making a lot of noise and we live in suburbia. <laughs> yeah. And Nada told me after I finished that within probably a minute and a half of me making that noise, the lady across the road rang her and she said, Nada, are you okay? Are you all right? Yeah. And we felt that was a very positive thing. Uh, and for Nada particularly, she felt as though that somebody really, you know, sort of cared about her. And yeah. it made us both feel safe that we can do this without fearing that police turn. <laughs> so that, that, that neighbour obviously did care about you because uh, unlike what happened the last weekend, um, the, na the neighbour tried to call you first. I'm sure if they didn't get you, they might have called the police then, maybe. But, but at least they demonstrated love to you. And that's, lo that's fantastic when you feel that coming at you from somebody you, know, you may not have even known very well. And that's a lovely healing type of uh, emotion that you can also receive, certainly. Um, Brian, can I ask Brian? Oh, give him the other girls a bit of a chance and not Brian. So. Has my mic gone? I don't think so. Oh, okay. I'm having trouble with it today, so we'll just uh, see how we go. It's working out? Um, yeah, it sounds like it. Uh, I feel like I haven't stopped processing since last week, the angry activist. Um, but I'm wondering if you can help me with what's going on at the moment. I seem to have um, my grandfather's sexual rage and feelings of powerlessness associated with that, conflicting with my mother's anger at him. My mother was perpetrated against by him. Yeah. And I seem to have this war going on inside me that I can't resolve. And yeah, can you give me any clues about how I might help myself deal with that, please? Sure. Um, firstly, your grandfather's sexual rage, you're feeling a lot of it at the moment um, because your grandfather, as you know, is around you at times. And so you're actually feeling it from him. There's another thing, I was actually born on his birthday. Yeah. So, so there, is, there are some significant things going in be, on between you and your grandfather. And, um, your grandfather does have a lot of anger towards the feminine, and, uh, and he sees homosexuality to a degree as sort of a feminine thing rather than a masculine thing. And so he's directing a lot of his sexual rage at you. Yeah, and so that's something that, that you're having to deal with. And then, I feel, Brian, you cited on your mother's uh, emotions, like uh, you have a deep sort of commiseration, I suppose, feeling towards women uh, and the fact that women have been abused because as a, as a male and as a homosexual, often that's what's been aimed at you, so you can deeply relate to a woman's sexual abuse. And uh, to a degree, this is what's attracting grandfather's uh, uh, feelings. So the key for you is to go into your emotional sadness and grief about how you've been treated as a, as, a, as a homosexual man and allow yourself to fully connect to those emotions. And what you, you, the other feelings you're feeling are actually your grandfather's feelings towards you. All right? so, so you can talk to your grandfather about what he's done. Uh, you, know, you obviously have spirit connection, so you can talk to him about what he's done. You can talk to him about he needs to go away and feel his own sexual rage towards women um, and work through that emotionally rather than projecting it at you because that's what he's doing at the moment. Does that make sense? And Jen? Uh,
goes, the button goes right up. Um, this morning, and Graham and I had um, some things happen for us. Um, I wrote it down. Is it alright if I just read it? No. Okay. I want instead for you to come up here, and I want to talk to you about another issue. I know. <laughs> and you can leave the mic there because I've got one here for you. I don't buy it. You're worried that I do, though. <laughs> Sit down. Do you remember yesterday when you were talking to me up here? Yes. Do you remember what you were saying to me? Um, lots of it, yes. Yeah. Do you remember how when you started you said, you said to me, you're Jesus, and then off you went. Do you remember that? Yes. What do you feel about that now? That you can't help me. Can that, you, did you that, get... that in reality you're just a man doing a job and I've got to do it for me. Yes. So can you see how you were expressing your rage really in that moment towards me? What you were doing in that moment was you were saying that I would somehow be able to fix this in you. Can you see that? Yeah. And there was that expectation in you that I somehow fix something in you. So that was an expression, even though you were crying, that was an expression of anger. If you were ragefully crying in that moment. You were actually wanting me to fix something rather than you actually feel the painful emotion you were experiencing. Now the next thing that happened after that was that you did exactly the same thing with one of your sons. Remember, what, what you, one of the things you said with your son was, you know, you asked him how he's doing, and he turned around and, and he got angry with you. And remember, you were crying about that. Yeah. But actually, that was just masking over some rage towards men as well. What you were masking over there was the fact that you had created this rage within him, and now you're upset that he's doing it to you, and you want him to stop. That was the emotion. But I gave him permission to, no, you be angry, to be angry. No, you didn't. I know verbally you did. But from an emotional perspective, you're, you're saying to him, please don't be angry with me, son. Please don't be angry with me, son. This hurts me. That's the emotion that was coming from you towards him in that instant. That's why he reacted to it. So, so what was happening there was, again, a denial you were expecting your son not to be rageful with you because you didn't want to feel the pain of your own emotion. So you remember then you said to, you said the same, a similar thing about God soon after that in the conversation. You felt angry with God that God's created this system where you did things. Do you remember that? Where you did things yeah. to other people that harmed them and you did them unconsciously is yeah. what you were saying. Yeah. Now what you were doing in that instance was you were blaming God for the pain you were feeling. And in every one of those instances, you are not going to fully allow yourself to feel the pain itself. Can you see what I'm saying to you? Now I didn't raise this with you yesterday because you weren't in the space where I could say these things. You were more in the space today where I could say them. But what was actually happening in that, almost in that entire interaction, there was a projection of emotion in every single case of anger towards me, God, your son, and instead of you allowing yourself to completely feel the pain you were in. And, and the, so how do I get to that then? Well, there's, 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 the issue is that you're still not fully willing to feel that pain without feeling like someone else is to blame for it. Do you, do you follow me? 
So at the moment, there's still this feeling in you that your parents are to blame for it, God's to blame for it, AJ's to blame for it, Jesus is to blame for it, right? Your son's to blame for it. But there's, there's this, not this full feeling in you that actually no one's to blame for it. I've just got to feel it. Do you see the difference? I've just got to feel it without projecting the blame, without projecting the need, the, the desire for someone else to take it away from me. If you're telling me that in that moment of being so broken down, I still wasn't feeling the depth of my pain, then I don't understand. I know. But that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Because at, at that moment, what you were doing was you were projecting anger at God, at me, at your son, at your father, but, but you were not yet at that point fully experiencing the grief of the emotion itself, the pain of the emotion itself. So what true repentance is, is feeling the pain of the emotion itself. The pain of the emotion that you were experiencing yesterday was that you have harmed other people. That was the feeling you had. You've harmed your sons. Yes. That was the feeling you had. But instead of just feeling that feeling, you were blaming God for it, you were blaming me for it, wanting me to take it away from you, you were even blaming your son, you were blaming your father, but you weren't allowing yourself just to feel that you, you, not them, you had created harm in others. Now, when you allow yourself to allow yourself to fully feel that you created the harm in others, without feeling blame for any single other person, then you will be repentant, and that's when God's love can reach in you and take away the causal emotion. Does that make sense to you? When you're prepared to feel the pain of everything you've caused, that's when God's love can enter in you and pull out the cause of emotion. Until that time, you'll be going through this cycle. I'm not sure I can believe you, though. I know. But that's something you'll have to and, work out between yourself and God. And this is the first God. time... This is the first time I've gotten to the... to the reality, if you like, because it's real for me. Yep. Um, that I don't actually believe you. Yeah. That's right. And this is why you revert. It's not that I don't want to. I know that. It's not that I don't want to repent. It's not that I don't want to own. It is. That people, it isn't. It is. I know I've hurt others. No, 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 stop for a moment. Your actions yesterday prove that you don't want to own. Your actions were blaming God, blaming me, blaming your son, blaming your father, but not feeling the damage you have done to someone else. That was your actions yesterday, which is proof, in fact, that you don't want to feel that particular emotion. So there's other emotions you have wanted to feel. I'm not, say, I'm not saying this is right across the board. I'm saying with this particular emotion, which is the emotion that you feel is a law of compensation emotion, that you have damaged your own children. The truth is that you do not want to see the extent of the damage, nor do you want to feel it inside of you. Okay, so what do I need to do? Well, pray to God about the desire to feel it. Pray to God about... Because whenever you're, whenever you're angry with God, or you're angry with me, or you're angry with your son, or you're angry with your father, that's when you're demonstrating a desire not to feel it. Because remember, anger is the thing that's suppressing the, the emotion. It keeps you away from the emotion. When you fully get into that painful feeling, and one of the statements you said to me yesterday was, if this is how much pain I'm going to have to feel, I don't want to feel it, is one of the statements that you that you said. And I said, yes, Jen, this is how much pain you're going to have to feel. And you are going to have to feel it if you want to get closer to God. That's the statement I said to you in return. But you didn't hear that very well yesterday. The key is to allow yourself to fully connect with the grief inside of yourself. There's no blame, oh, there's no blame coming from me here. This is just saying to you, Fully connect to the grief inside of you, right, of what you've created. I'm afraid, AJ. I know. People. The one person that's really close to me, that I've let get close to me, caused me damage. Yeah. And 
They don't get damaged. Like, aren't I damaged? I don't know. Well, I've, I've mentioned publicly all of my damage, so yes, that, I'm damaged. That means to me that I'm not ever going to be I'm damaged. You can't fix it. You now, can't ever this, be healed. This is your emotion now, and this is a good emotion to connect to, because it, it's what you believe. It's not true. The truth is I am damaged, but also the truth is I can heal. That's the point of us doing this, Jen. Because in the end we can all heal. I'm so afraid of the judgments. I'm afraid of them. Okay. So let yourself feel that fear and then work through that, what it means to you. But you, you can get, do this just like anyone else can. But when somebody says to you, you are damaged, they are true, they are right. You are damaged. And if someone says that to me, judgment. well, no, it's the truth. It's a judgment if the person looks down on me when they say it. But the truth is, I'm damaged, you're damaged, and every single person here is damaged. We're damaged. all damaged. And it's, I'm not judging anyone, including myself. I'm just stating the truth. But if I say, you're damaged, Jen, and you're a bad person, and I just can't, you know, and I look down upon you, and I have that feeling coming at you, now I'm judging you. Now, if you feel judged from me just saying that you're damaged, then you're just feeling your own judgment of yourself about you not being perfect. So feel it. Because that's all it is. It's not real. It's just your judgment of yourself. So you need to feel that feeling. It's not the truth, though. The truth is that you, just the same as anyone else, can release all of this damage. And you, all of us here will, at some point in our future life, become perfect. Okay, so Even though we're damaged. It's really scary for me. I feel fear, okay, right now. Good. I felt it when I walked down towards you. Yeah. How do I go from there to connect to the desire of what you're presenting to me? Okay. Well, the first thing to do is release what do I the do fear. Next? Release the fear. So when you go back to your seat in a second, have you got a notepad with you or something like that? Yeah. Okay. Get out that and start writing down what you're afraid of now. The truth is that you are afraid that I'm not saying who, I'm, who I am, who I say I am, that I'm not really who I say I am. The truth is that, that you feel that if you deal with your emotions it might not work, that, that mm -hmm. in the end you might be dealing with the emotions and, and do all of the things I'm suggesting to you and at the end that it might not work. Yes. And the truth is that you feel that if you deal with these emotions that you'll finish up losing a relationship that you're only just trying to get. Like the truth is that you have a lot of fears still about these things. Allow yourself to acknowledge them, write them down. But specifically about my sons. I need to get to the next step. Okay? So I'll... what are you afraid of with your sons? <laughs> you're afraid you've done so much damage that they'll never recover. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I can assure you that when you release the damage within yourself, they will begin to recover. That's the yes. truth. Does yes. that make sense? So, so that's what you need to do. But, but at the moment, the thing you need to do is just feel the full extent of the damage to your sons. And by the way, this applies to all parents. Allow yourself to feel the full extent of the damage to your children and pray to God, ask God to forgive you for that damage. And you will find that God can then, through love, just pick you, grab hold of all that causal emotion inside of you that may take a hundred years for you to deal with any other way, and God will be able to just help remove that from you. Does that make sense? Allow yourself to do that. So what I'm saying, Jen, applies to all parents here and really all people who have had an interaction with another person that's damaged them. Allow yourself to feel the pain of the damage, but take that to God and you'll find in that instance you'll be one of the, will be one of the closest moments you've had with God when you do that. Can I please ask you, Jeffrey left and went home in the car with Nicholas my other boy, yep. and they had an argument, 
and Jeffries exploded. Yep. And beat the dashboard and broke his wrist at the same time as I was up here. Yep. Am I to blame for that? There because was a, I wasn't fully repentant. There's a direct relationship between their interaction and what is happening with you emotionally. So, so you, I'm not saying you're to blame. Obviously, he is an adult man who can fully not bash the bash the dashboard of the car if he chooses to not do it. But what I'm saying is there is a direct relationship between the emotions that you refuse to process within yourself and what happens to them. So allow yourself to see that. Their argument was caused by emotions in them that you partially created. When I say partially, there was an absence of a father or a father that created it as well, not just you. But that was my decision anyway. No, that's, that's fine. The key is for you to just see the damage you've done and allow yourself to fully experience it. When you do that and direct that to God, that's when repentance occurs, and that's also when divine love flows into your soul. Do, do you see what I'm saying? I'll talk more about this subject when we talk about prayer and other subjects in the future. But I wanted to address this with you, because yesterday you were in this state where you were crying and feeling some of that emotion, but there was lots of anger being projected while you were doing it, and you didn't realise that. In your pain, you didn't realise no, how much you were projecting out of everything else. Does that make sense? Thanks. Um, I just wanted to mention something about what Jen said about judgement. Um, I haven't been to a lot of these and I've never met Jen, but it um, goes with what you're saying about with the spirit involvement of last night. And I was sitting further up the back, and I noticed when Jen was actually getting up, the whole audience was quite drawn to her. And I almost, and the words that came to my mind was messenger, straight away, as if there was also spirits sort of entering her to, to sort of come forward and do that. And the reason why I think it's related to anger and it feels to me that she sort of doesn't really connect with it at the moment is because one after another it felt like it was alternate spirits anger coming out and hitting you with it. Yeah. That was exactly what was happening. Because Jen was denying the anger within herself about those emotions, and what was happening was the spirits in those instances were just connecting and giving me a barrage basically. Um, I felt a lot more of it than what she was actually saying, obviously. So, but that was certainly happening. And many of you, when Jen gets up to speak, go into a state of contraction um, for different reasons. And that's something for you to also look at in terms of emotionally look at that. Why do you go into a state of contraction when, when Jen speaks? Because you do need to have a good look at that, what's going on inside of yourself emotionally. Now, the reason why I've been involved with Jen in a lot of these discussions is she's so open emotionally to be involved, and I know she's triggering many of you while I'm doing it. And secondly, also, is that uh, she does have quite a lot of spirit influence at times that she's not aware of, and, uh, and I'm involving the spirits in the interaction in, in this group through, through that mechanism as well. Besides the fact that I love her, and I think she's going to do wonderfully on the Divine Love part. Um, so, uh, if, if all of us can bear that in mind, is that in every one of these groups, the reason why the emotions ebb and flow is because there is often heavy spirit influence at different times and at other times. And there's also often within ourselves certain reactions that are going on. And you know, some of those reactions are positive and some of those reactions can be quite like, upset and negative and angry and frustrated and why is AJ doing this and all of those kind of emotions as well. And so allow yourself to feel that while this is happening. Allow yourself to let to note down your triggers, if you like, the, the emotions that are presented to you through this process. Yeah, yeah I sort of felt like she was more of a gateway between the thing that was both, and it's um, yeah, sort of both in from both worlds. And I know it's very painful for her. Can you say this into a mic if you're yeah. still there? So, yeah, I was thinking that, that you can see it's obviously very painful for her to go through because it's happening through her, but at the same time, yeah, it's just. 
witness? Yeah, those of you who weren't here um, Friday night, I mentioned to Jed one reason why that it's so difficult for her to determine the difference between her own emotion and spirits with her is that she is very, very open to hearing spirits. And the reason why I identified an emotion in her which is yet to work through, and that is this emotion that she needs to be heard. And many of these spirits who are in lower conditions also have the same emotion. All they want is someone to hear them. All they want is someone to actually listen to their story. And, and so that, that emotion connects with Jen's emotion, which is why the spirits find it so easy to connect through her and state their stories. But unfortunately, it also interferes to a degree with her processing of some of her own emotions. And one reason why I invited her up just now is because I wanted to identify to her and to you as an audience too, the times when she was not actually dealing with the emotion, but actually was projecting anger rather than dealing with the emotion. So there'll be many times in your life where you're crying and you'll think you're dealing with grief, but in our reality you'll be dealing with anger. Because you just feel like this, you know, you'll feel this blame while you're crying. So if you're crying, and you're feeling blamed towards others while you're doing it, like, why can't they help me? Why can't they, you know, this kind of thing. So I'm crying away. Why can't they, why can't she love me more? You know, that kind of crying. I am not in a causal emotion. What I'm in is an effect emotion of anger that's actually preventing me from going deeper into the causal emotion. And I can cry for years and years and years on effect emotions like that. I personally have done that. I personally cried for almost seven years about a relationship doing exactly that. Crying about the effect, why can't she love me, why can't she? Instead of just feeling the feeling and actually feeling the grief about being unloved, the fact that I'm, in, in my case, it was this feeling that nobody can ever love me, that I'm unlovable, I'm unlovable. And so, often times we're actually feeling the emotional layer that's above the real core. And this is why many people have this feeling that if I emotionally process, I'll be doing it the rest of my life. And the truth is, that if you emotionally process at the effect level, you will be doing it the rest of your life. Right? So if I'm emotionally processing and while I'm feeling these emotions and crying, I'm actually blaming another person, Right at that moment, I am actually, and that, that is not a causal emotion. And I can do that for the rest of my life. And my suggestion is don't do that. I did that for seven years or so, and it's very, very painful. So don't do that. Allow yourself to step the level below that, which is no longer a state of blame and no longer a state of trying to punish somebody, and no longer a state of trying to have somebody else fix you. When you're in the emotion itself, you won't feel those emotions. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. And we'll open the corner here, if we can. Thanks, Nick. Right up there, Nick. Does it mean that you have to get to being responsible for it? Um, like saying you can blame others and saying, oh, why did they? Have, why did that happen to me? And all of that stuff. Whereas it's. Um, I can feel your question. You want to know whether that means you've got to take responsibility for everything that's happened to you. Is that pretty much the question? I feel that. Yeah, and you don't have to take responsibility for every event that's happened to you. The reason why is that many of the events that happened to you happened to you when you were a child and other people have full responsibility for those events. However, you do need to take full responsibility for the emotion that you have decided to shut down within yourself as a result of those events happening to you. Can you see the difference of what I'm saying? So, for example, let's say there was a th when I was three, I was abused by my I'm a, I'm a female, let's say, three years of age, abused sexually by my father. Right? Let's say that occurred to me. Right? That, that's what occurred. So let's say that occurred to me. 
I don't need to take responsibility for the event because he does. He did the damage, he did the problem, he, he had the emotional injuries. But, but what I need to take responsibility for is allowing myself to feel the emotions of what that created in me. So I, I felt hurt by that. So let yourself feel hurt by that. I felt like, like he, w w I felt confused that w why wouldn't dad love me and what, this is hurting me. So let myself feel that, feel that feeling. And the instant you let yourself feel that feeling and talk to God about that feeling, that's when God reaches in and says, right, you've got it now. I can help take that away from you now. And this was so long. Yeah. And that's the key thing is let God reach in. And the way that we let God reach in is by allowing ourselves to feel the underlying emotion. So that's what I mean by taking responsibility. I don't mean that you have to take responsibility. There's this common New Age belief that I'm responsible for every event that was perpetrated against me. No, you're not. I'm sorry, but you are not. You're not responsible when you were three years of age for your father raping you. You're not. Right? But there are emotions that were created inside of you from that event that you've held on to up until now and you are responsible in the sense that you need to let yourself begin to feel them. When you do and you pray to God about them, that's when God reaches in. So what God wants is a, the softening of our heart that we will allow ourselves to feel our emotion. That's all God needs from us. He can do the rest. Thank you. Yeah. Raya down the front. I just want to share a little bit more about uh, reflections from Jen from yesterday. And um, yesterday evening at dinner, I was talking about some of the things that had happened here yesterday. And I got really, really angry about um, the dynamic that went on between you and Jen. And then I read the list of all of the causes for anger this morning. And then you drew all of the circles up here. And I saw that Jen was exposing that center. And that's what I've been covering all these years with all those layers of that circle. All the way out, I've, I've just been operating all of them. And that I was really mad at her for making me look at that yeah. yesterday. Yeah. And uh, so I'm still unraveling that. In fact, she's been trying to show me that for nine months since we've been coming and working with you and have had layers and layers and layers of resistance because she was exposing my source of pain. So yeah. I just want to say I see that now. That's it. Whenever we have an emotion of judgment towards another person, there's usually something in this interaction that causes us to want to repel the person. And I'm not saying that it's the same emotion they're having. But often what happens is that there is some kind of sympathetic or resonant emotion going on within us that's being triggered by this interaction. So for many of you, if Jen gets up to here and talks to me, for some of you, you feel like she's stealing the limelight is the feeling that you have. Well, that's the resonant emotion that gets triggered. For some others of you, there's this feeling of, like, why does she want to take all the time? So that's another resonant emotion that if I probably had siblings or someone else like that, in your life take time away from you or take a person's love away from you is the feeling you've had. And so these, all of these types of emotions get triggered in us and the key is whenever we get into judgement to realise that hang on a sec, this judgement is just covering over lots and lots of stuff within me. It might not be the thing that you're judging that it's covering over but there will be something related to the, to the thing you're judging that it is certainly, or the situation you're judging that is covering over. I had a vague feeling about all that, but I couldn't. Okay, so I've been kind of nibbling around the edges on this for the last few times we've been together. And uh, it wasn't until you laid it out very clearly on the documentation yesterday, and when you drew those circles this morning, and I'm 70 now, you know, and I see how many years I've been building those constructs, and it was the clear way that you laid it out. It's like the whole thing just started to unravel. Exactly. So, 
I'm really grateful for that because it's been running me for a long time. Yeah. And the, the beauty of the truth is it immediately begins to unravel our soul problems. That's the beauty of truth. Yeah. And so if you can always remember, if, you, if you're struggling to unravel what's going on within yourself, it's because you're struggling with truth. So the key thing is to always get back to truth and that will always have the effect of unravelling you emotionally and getting back to the core emotions. It was also the clarity of the diagrams that helped tremendously. That's good, that's good. And Nina, thanks. And then in front of you. Uh, I just feel to support Jen with a story that happened to me when I first met you. I really connected to repentance and truth. Yep. And I was on my front veranda and I owned that I was actually really angry with my daughter. Yeah. For how difficult she'd made my life. Yeah. And which by the way she hadn't done. And almost instantaneously I connected to what I'd done to create her difficulties. Yeah. And she's since given me some really amazing feedback on that. Yeah, that's great. And within two minutes, this whole process was less than five minutes. I got a phone, my phone rang and it was Amber on the other end of the line and she said, Mum. I've just had this realisation how difficult I've been and I'm actually ringing up to see how you are. Yeah. And it can happen that quickly. That happened in the space of five minutes. Yeah. So it was once you began to feel the repentance of what you had created that, that then the emotion is freed up in your daughter. And this is how it works with our children. Is that When we fully experience the emotion within ourselves, that's when everything frees up on the, on the other end. So. You know, this is where it's always, it's always going to get back to. So when a person says to me, oh, what can I do to help my son? Or what can I do to help my daughter? They already are not understanding one basic principle. And that is, you need to focus on what you have done. You created your son. You created your daughter. Emotionally. First thing, you need to take responsibility for that, for the emotions, and feel the creation. Feel it completely. Then you will then things will change. I was just blown away. Yeah. You know, all that happened within about five minutes. It yeah. was like, wow. It can happen so rapidly. Yeah. Um, it can go on to the... Uh, I'm a bit <laughs> confused and overwhelmed at the difference between taking responsibility in the law of attraction because Conceptually, I've convinced myself that I'm not to blame for what's happened, but I feel completely because I believe in the law of attraction. And I'm really stuck now. You, you mean to say to blame with what's happened in your own life or in other people's lives? Okay. And with regard to your own life, and this applies to every single person in the audience, and that is that everything that's happened to you had a beginning in you emotionally. Now, because most of the beginnings happen way, way back into your childhood emotions, everything that you've done since then has been based upon childhood emotions mixed with the personality you have and the decisions you made after that, those events. Now, obviously, when you're little, like I'm talking you know, young from just born, or before you're born, pre-birth, up until seven years of age, for example, during that time, What's happening is you, you're mostly reflecting the unhealed emotions in your parents and all of the emotional damage you get is their suppression of you doing that. Now, after that time in particular, and it's particularly that time because we start getting more and more self-awareness after that time, and so we start making choices or decisions based upon that emotional damage. And we gradually become more and more self-responsible for those choices or decisions. So a person, for example, who's been abused at the age of three years of age sexually is not responsible for the event of the abuse when they were three years of age. But if they're now 30 years of age abusing another person, they are responsible for the fact that they're now abusing the other person. Does that make sense? So if that 30-year-old man, for example, who was abused when he was three is now abusing another three-year-old, he is responsible for the decision that he makes there. It's the unhealed emotions that he had from three years of age that and, and added to the decisions he then made that created his condition when he was 30. Now, 
in terms of emotions, he is fully responsible for every single emotion that is inside himself and fully responsible for the feeling of those emotions. So he didn't create them necessarily, but he needs to feel them. If he felt them, he wouldn't even abuse the person when he was 30. Does that make sense? He would be feeling his own emotions instead. And he would be fully responsible for feeling his own emotions about what's happening in his own life. So when I say emotional responsibility, what I'm saying is we need to understand that the only person that can release an emotion inside of myself is myself. No one else can do it for me. But as soon as I have the desire and willingness to feel the emotion, I'll be feeling it, and at that moment, God's love can enter us and assist the entire process. But if I'm closed down emotionally, I can't be assisted. You remember in the discussion with the slave spirits yesterday, this is what something that came up. They had been abused most of, and tortured most of their life on earth. And they were in the first in the hells of the first sphere when they passed in the spirit world. And their feelings were, why am I here? This isn't fair. I was the one hurt. Right? That was their feeling. But what they hadn't realised was that all they needed to do to get from that place to a new place was to just feel the grief of the hurt. That's all they needed to do. Nothing else. And their refusal to feel the grief of the hurt is what caused them to be locked up in that place. So all God was waiting for them to do was for them to just open their heart to feel what actually happened. They just need to do, allow that to occur and then God could assist the rest of the process. But because of their refusal to do that, they hardened their heart, they then focused all this anger and rage as a result of hardening their heart on the people who harmed them and that caused their condition to not be able to grow, to they remain stagnant. And it's the same with us. You know, those slaves were not responsible for the events that, for, that of the master abusing them. The master is fully responsible for that, right? He was fully responsible for their abuse. What they were responsible for was to feel their emotion. That's all. And if they allowed themselves to feel that emotion, they would not have even attracted the abuse. Or, if they had attracted the abuse, they would not be angry about it. Right? They would just be feeling their emotions. And when they arrived in the spirit world, they would have arrived in the place where they imagined themselves to arrive. And this the same thing applies to us today. All we need to do is just feel and choose to feel our causal emotion. That's all we need to do. That's what we're responsible for. This is self-responsibility. That doesn't mean I'm responsible for all the bad things that happened to me during my childhood. What it means is I need to be responsible for the emotion that's in me that I'm locking up about those events. And the instant I free that is the instant God can work with me. And the reason why God, it feels for some of us like God isn't working with us is because we're not allowing that to occur. Does that make sense to everyone? We're just not allowing that process to occur. Yeah. Okay, there was a question about expressing anger or expressing emotions. Um, yesterday when Ian was showing us his anger kit, he was wringing the tail as such and I thought he was wringing someone's neck. <laughs> Which is what he felt. <laughs> yes, yeah. And, um, but previously you'd said about even if you think of harming someone, you're causing your self emotional damage or soul damage. Uh, yeah. so, well actually what I was saying is if you're thinking of harming someone, there is already the damage in your soul that would create a murder. Do you understand that? So, for example, if I'm thinking of harming you, whether I'm harming you or not, there's an emotion in me that's strong enough to create a murder. So my soul condition is judged by what, how I'm feeling, not by what I've done. You understand that? Okay. So if we take that one step further, and I'll just move this around. If we take that one step further and draw a little diagram, as I have to do, 
the first point, and, and I've said this before, and I'm just going to get rid of some of these uh, things so that I don't get that. Um, now, which one am I? I don't really know which one. It's that one. Yeah. Now, the first thing is that if I, if I deny I have any emotion at all, of anger or rage within me, when I do have anger and rage in me, then at that point I am projecting the most to my outside environment. Mm. Mm. Right? And you can experiment this with your children if you want to. The instant you deny your emotion with your, any of your children, they will express your emotion to its full intensity. The reason why is because when I'm in full denial of an emotion, I am projecting that emotion to the world at large at its fullest intensity. Mm. Let's say I go through the second step, and that is I come to have an intellectual realisation that I have a certain emotion. At that point, I am now projecting the emotion at a lesser intensity than I was when I was in full denial. Mm. I'm still projecting the emotion because the emotion is still within me. It's still something that's within me. So I'm still projecting the emotion, but it's at a lesser intensity than it was when I was in full denial. If I openly verbalise, the emotion, I'm now even expressing it in a lesser intensity than it was before. So there's now a less strong emotion coming from me. So I can be saying, so here I might be saying, let's say I have an emotion that I want to kill my father for what he did to me. And I'm in total denial of it. That's when I'm projecting that emotion at its full intensity. Let's say I have a fleeting inspiration Oh, I want to kill my father. An intellectual realisation. At that moment, I'm now producing less feelings going out of me that I want to kill my father. If I actually say, you know what, I really want to kill my father, I'm now actually producing less of projection out to the universe again. But then I need to start going through the next level of things, and that is the soul-based realizations these are all remember soul is always feeling feeling based realizations because when I have a realization that I want to kill my father at a feeling level I am going to be gutted by it can you see that like I'm just going wow I never knew you know you have some really strong emotional feelings about and sometimes you may even have feelings of shame or guilt associated with these feelings of, whoa, whoa, you know, how bad is this? You know what I mean? That kind of feeling you have of, I never saw this in me before, and now I'm seeing it, you know? Now I'm actually projecting less again. Do you see what I'm saying? Now, once I start feeling the rage, so once I have a soul feeling of what's in there, so let's say it's anger or rage, I am now projecting it even less again while I'm feeling it. Now, I'm not saying dumping it on them. I'm saying feeling it like Ian was demonstrating yesterday. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm now feeling it even less again. When I say I'm feeling it, if you're doing it, you're this angry rage, I'm feeling less from you because there's less coming projected at the universe around you when you're owning more of it. Now, there's many more, many more levels I've got to go through here. If it's rage, then I've got to have a feeling about what the rage is about. And then I'll have to have a feeling about that underlying causal emotion. And when I get down to right to the core of it, now there's nothing coming out of me and nothing that can damage anyone around me. So can you see that each step is like a step of opening? It's like a, you can think of it like your soul, like a flower opening, right? Each step is like you opening, and more come, you're owning more of it, so therefore less of it is going out to the universe. 
and each change you make in this step is going to greatly aid everything going on around you. So, if you want to wring someone's neck and you actually physically do the sensation of wringing their neck, in that particular, but not actually physically wringing their neck, but, you know, with a towel, wringing the neck of the towel, I want to wring their neck, you're actually in this state of feeling, the soul feeling its rage. That is far better than you doing anything above that. It's not better than you doing anything below that because there's more you need to do. Does that make sense? You need to get to the point that's deeper and deeper and deeper. But how do you get to that point if you don't allow yourself to go through it? And this is one of the things that uh, a lot of the New Age teachings and a lot of the moral teachings of the Natural Love Path teach you to detune from this process of thinking through it. And they teach you to try and do it all in an intellectual level, which actually doesn't reduce the emotion coming from the person. So quite often I meet people that, I've, that say they've been doing you know, new age type things or they've been spiritual people for 30 years and I'm feeling this intense rage coming from them. You know, I, 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 there was someone I met recently who does uh, grief therapy and there's this intense anger with his father like that is coming from him, you know, like I don't know how, how people around him respond to their grief when he's got this intense rage going towards men, you know. But he is totally unaware of it. Totally unaware. Totally unaware that the emotion even exists within himself. Doesn't want to even acknowledge it. So he's in this place, and that's when everyone around him is getting the full burst of it. If he was in this place, at least they'd be getting less of it. But the problem is there's so much judgment about this place, the soul feeling and a rageful emotion. There's a lot and so much judgment. There's so much hurt about feeling the emotion. There's so much feelings in people about that it's bad, it's wrong, it's sinful, and yet it's the way or the gateway into, the, or the guide, if you like, into even the deeper parts. Now, what I'm suggesting is we need to get into the deeper parts. You can't just stop there. So don't stop in your anger. You need to get below your anger. But you're not going to get below your anger while you're denying your anger. Just like you're not going to get, you know, you're not going to get to the soul realisation while you're wanting to not talk about it. And you're not going to get to the um, talking about it while you're intellectually denying it. Do you know what I mean? So allow yourself to sink through these places and allow yourself to become aware. Talk freely about those things. And right at the back, thanks. Hi, AJ. Um, just a question. Talking about um, owning things and taking ownership on board of your own feelings, what about how do you stop yourself from taking on board other people's actions and other people's, you know, like with my father? I look at his actions and how he responds to people, and I just think, oh my God, that, he just, you know, did this, this, or this, your whole life would be a lot better. And that, I suppose I take on board that. And I think I want to fix it, yep. but I can't fix him. Him, no. no. But and it causes a lot of rifts between. There's a an lot emotional of... reason in you as to why you want to take on their life. The key is to allow yourself to start to feel the reason for that. Now, usually the reasons are twofold. In that there are two branches to it. There's usually a thing in them that you're seeing that you are don't want to see anymore. Yeah like something in them that you're seeing that you don't want to see anymore, which means there's an emotion in you of judgement about what you're seeing from them that you want to stop in them. The second thing is that obviously there's a law of attraction involved, so there's an emotion being triggered in yourself that you're wanting to stay away from. So often what we do is we focus our life onto helping others in order to avoid emotions within ourselves. So when, it, like, and this was a major problem that I had in the past where um, I spent a lot of time helping others and yet I was locked up with lots and lots of emotions. And it's a major problem with, in fact, why a lot of people enter the medical profession or any of the helping professions, the social working profession and so forth, is that often their emotions locked up in themselves that they want to assist others to release because they don't, they, it's a way of avoiding the emotion within themselves. But I sort of don't feel I'm avoiding because I just feel that... I just want to make it good for him because this is how because I, I feel why? 
Why? Yep. Because well, I know what it's like to have those nice relationships and I'd like him to experience that. Why? Well, he doesn't want it. No, no. So why do you want him to? Because so he's affecting other people as well. Well, there's that, there's one, but also you're feeling responsible for him. So why is that? Don't yeah, there's childhood emotion there. Why do you feel responsible for him? You, you've become the parent of your parent. Mm -hmm. And you know that, like this is how you're acting, as a parent towards your own parent. So from childhood, your parents made you, you responsible for their emotion. Does that make sense? Yeah, probably. So, probably right. Yeah. So, so you now believe you are responsible for their emotion, and the one of the reasons why you are responsible is because that's the only time you get loved. See, this is and this is the thing you get back. The thing you get back is if he does do the changing, you can feel part of the change will be he loves you more. Yeah, probably. Probably right, right there actually. Yeah. yeah. So, so what what's happening is by you trying to fix his life, you, what you're really trying to do is him, get him to love you more. But, but he doesn't love you more because right from your childhood, he's been making you responsible for his emotion. And so you now, as an adult, take full responsibility for his emotion. And in reality, that's an emotion inside of you that you need to heal. The truth is that you're not responsible for his emotions at all. But the reason why you feel you are is because if you don't take responsibility for his emotions, he will not love you in return. And that's the truth. He hasn't loved you. And he's not capable of loving you until he takes responsibility for his own emotions. But I don't think he ever will. And that's, and there's, that's why you do it. Because if, if he never does, then you want to get him to do it so that you can feel more love. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It yeah. does. But I, I suppose I just want him to experience what I've experienced in with other relationships, I suppose. Well, you want him to change for your own benefit, actually. Mm -hmm. But I don't depend on him for my happiness. Uh, you know what I'm saying? I, d I don't, because I've got a wonderful life, but that is one thing that... I'm sorry, but I have to disagree with you. Okay. There is a factor of your life where you are dependent upon him for your happiness. Because there's a really core emotion in there that Daddy doesn't love me. Daddy can't love me. I need to fix Daddy so Daddy can love me. <coughs> and that's a very, very basic childhood emotion. And you need to allow yourself to just just experiment with that a bit. I know at the moment. But experiencing not feeling the love, is that what you're saying? Or yeah, stop helping him right. and see how you feel. See, at the moment, the addiction that you have is to help him. If you help him, you feel good about yourself. You always go mad at him because I go, what do you do that for? Why can't you say this? Or yeah, so stop getting mad at him <laughs> and stop helping him. And then, then notice how you feel. You'll feel guilt, guaranteed. Mm -hmm and then drop down under the guilt and allow yourself yep. to feel the emotions that you feel underneath that. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Um, just a general comment for everyone. You take away your addiction, you will definitely at some point feel the emotion. Now, you know how cigarette smoking is an addiction? If you take away the addiction of cigarette smoking, in other words, you stop cigarette smoking, what will happen is you'll feel the reasons why you started it in the first place. Now, a lot of people in that situation take up eating lollies <laughs> or eating chocolate because that, that satisfies that addiction, right? This is why sometimes, or eating food, this is why sometimes people who give up the addiction of cigarette smoking start getting larger when they were nice and slim all their life because they're just swapping one addiction for the other. If you actually get rid of the addiction and feel your emotion, and I'm talking now not just about physical addictions like cigarette smoking, but actual emotional addictions, things that you're emotionally addicted to, if you give that up and just allow yourself to feel your emotion, you will rapidly get into some causal emotion. It would be a very, very good way to access causal emotion. Hey Jay, is that why some people give up smoking and then they say, look, I never had a cold for 20 years and now I'm sick all the time? Yep. And um, colds are usually, colds and flus affect the chest area, obviously. And usually the chest area is a, is a deep cause of really a broken love feeling inside of a person. One reason why um, people who smoke get lung cancers is a heavy suppression of chest-based, or, or if you think of it, heart chakra-based emotions, which are all based around love, the giving of love and the receiving of love. So yes, a person who gives up smoking will often get colds after that because 
the emotion of being unloved is starting to get triggered in them, but they're still trying to deny it. Before they could deny it with the smoke, now they can't deny it, so, so now there's a physical symptom. And that will continue to occur until they start allowing the grief to occur. And so there's a lot of tie-up between physical addictions and emotional addictions and then the underlying emotion that we're trying to wrap in cotton wool and avoid. And just over there. Uh, no, um, it'll be like the dawning of the day. <laughs> All right. So say your name for everyone's benefit. I'm Mary Ellen. Mary Ann. Mary Ellen. Mary Ellen. Um, I started feeling like I was ex um, experiencing emotions at the end of last year after Cornelius was talk. Yep, you really connected some emotions then, didn't you? Yep. 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 And it seemed to be improving a lot. Um, and then I started feeling like I was piggybacking other people's emotions and I should be feeling mine. Right. And I did get a little bit of um, success there, but not anywhere near the depth of feelings I got. It's all right, it just needs to be higher. Okay. That's it. We want, you to, we want to hear you. Um, I started accessing some, experiencing some emotions after Cornelius's talk last year, and I felt I was doing quite well with it over about um, five or six weeks, but then thought that I was just piggybacking off other people's problems or emotions, and that I should be feeling mine. And I started um, accessing not nearly as well, but doing some, um, and then... Can I just address that firstly? When we feel emotions that other people are feeling but can't feel our own, there's some really core belief systems that are going on within us and core fears. And many of you will find that when somebody comes up here and starts expressing their emotion, you can connect with your emotion. But when you go home, you don't seem to be able to connect to it anymore. You notice that? And if you're noticing that, and that's a common issue that a lot of people have, if you're noticing that occurring, then it's because there's a feeling you have towards yourself that you don't have towards that other person who you're connecting with. So, for example, many of you, when Cornelius started describing some of the emotions that he was having about you know, anger and, and this terrible shame that he was feeling about himself and his actions in the first century, many of you really connected with that, didn't you? So many of you had this grief come up, by, and many of you in the audience at the time, or watching the DVDs may have felt that grief. What's happening there is, you view Cornelius as more important than yourself. That emotion is actually inside of you, but you're not letting you feel it, and you can only feel it if somebody else is feeling it, which means that you do not value yourself enough to feel it. Does that make sense to everyone? So, so that's the first issue that you're facing. One of the major primary emotions that you face is that I'm not allowed to feel my own emotion unless someone else is in agreement with my emotion. And can you see how that relates to your childhood as well? Or just not allowed, right up there. Or just not allowed to feel my emotion. Not allowed to feel your emotion, yeah. Yeah, which is definitely a childhood relation. There is a childhood relation between how your mum and dad viewed their own emotion and, and that's what caused you to suppress your own emotion. They taught me everything. They taught you everything you know. Yeah, exactly. Now, so that, does that understand that? So the first phase of what you're dealing with now, is, so the reason why you were feeling your emotions for six weeks or so is because you, you were doing, as you were saying, piggybacking your emotions on top of others. So them experiencing an emotion meant that you could experience your emotion because they gave you validation to experience your emotion. And they were the, the centre of attention. And, and yeah, exactly, exactly. Now what you're trying to do is swap it over so that you can be the centre of attention of dealing with your emotion. Mm -hmm. And because of that, in my other emotion, which is this emotion that I'm not worth anything, you're not allowing yourself to feel the emotion. Does that make sense? So that's the blockage. Mm -hmm. So the key is now to talk to God about how much you feel you are personally worth and how much you feel whether your emotions are worth anything and why you know in start investigating 
why you value other people's emotions more than your own. Does that make sense? Let yourself start investigating that emotionally. So pray about that. You know, start, start allowing yourself to feel why it's so easy for you to, to connect to something if someone else is connecting while you've got that validation. And you'll find there are a list of fears in there. So if you do some kind of a fear list and list the fears you have about your own emotion, you'll find that you'll access some things there. Now, can you continue with what you want? So I seem to be having some small success accessing my emotions. Good. And I go to the spiritualist church. Yep. And um, at the next Sunday after that started, I, um, the clairvoyant on platform came to me and said that um, this, the church was full of, filled with spirits and they were all excited about the work I was doing. And that, um, well, basically good things would happen and the church would get bigger and, and all that sort of stuff. And then before I, the next Sunday, I'd actually broken my leg. And that meant I couldn't um, cope at home and I went and stayed with my mother for a couple of months and wasn't able to get into it very much there at all, although I tried, I watched the DVDs a lot. And um, when I got back home, I thought I'd be able to just go back to where I left off when I was at home. I just seemed to have been really Shut down. Yeah. Yep. And it was interesting law of attraction for you. Uh, the breaking of the leg meant you had to stay with your mother. Mm -hmm. yes. And it's your mother that shut down your emotions. Mm -hmm. And and so while you were with your mother, did you find yourself closing down truth with her? Did you find yourself not being able to express the truth to her? Well, I found that's what I normally do, just shut down and, and just let her go. Yep. And but this time I sort of either stop her or interrupt her and say what I thought what you was feel? happening. Good. And, and how did you find that? It was pretty pointless, wasn't it? Well, it's actually very volatile. Exactly. I, <laughs> yeah, but she, she's completely more locked down than me. So, exactly. Um, she's, um, there's a bit of, I suppose, but she tends to get angry and stay very calm sounding. So she's very angry, calm anger. Like many parents do this, like real calm anger. Like I'm calm, but but I really I'd like to kill you. <laughs> that yeah. kind of anger. Um, yeah, or impose her opinion of it upon me. Exactly. In a very calm way, and then I'll react. I'll react by getting angry and yelling. Yep. And I'll just keep this up. Okay. Um, so there was a lot of. Oh, she actually started getting a little more loud when I yes. kept insisting on interrupting what she was saying. Awesome. Mm. I thought so actually. Yeah, very awesome. Yeah. But what actually happened inside of you was this. You came away feeling that it was pointless addressing any issue with your mother. That's the feeling that you had. And because your mother didn't validate your feelings, you now also feel that it's pointless addressing your own emotion. Mm. Does that make sense? So that's the feeling that you had, that you came away from your mother with. This feeling that, well, mum's never going to agree that, you know, that these things I'm saying are true. So if mum's never going to agree with it, what's the point? And, you know, are they even true? Do you know what I mean? I think it was more like it was, well, how can, something that, yes, you probably wouldn't. Yep. But that I wanted her to be able to. Yes, definitely. And, um, and what's the feeling that you wanted her to be able to address these issues, you tried addressing it with her, she just gets angry, the whole thing looks pointless, how did you then feel? Well, that her whole life's been like that, and that um, she's not going to listen to me um, telling her what I think she should do. So your feeling is, I'm not being listened to by my mother, my mother doesn't care about what I'm feeling or going through. Can you see there's quite a lot of emotions that, that are there, but but that you've come away feeling pointless about accessing them? Yourself, I mean. Yes, I guess, and it's partly because I feel that she's so locked down, she's not going to be able to. Oh, I, but yeah. can you see what you're saying in this? You're actually saying that you're, you're not able to feel your feelings because she's so locked down. 
That's really what you're saying. And this is a childhood belief, actually, that you have. And I guess it's also that yeah, she's more important than the, that um, I've got to try and help her have the realisations I've had um, before I can continue on. That's right. Mm. So what's happening with your suppression of your emotion at the moment is you've got this layer, is, layer of it. If mum doesn't want to do it, or if mum doesn't agree with it, then what's, there's no point in me doing it unless I've, you know, unless I've got her doing it too, sort of thing. There's this, but there's also this feeling, and I'm just trying to, I'm just feeling, sometimes I have trouble actually stating the feeling in words. Mary's better at this than I am. But um, I'm feeling a feeling from you when, with regard to your mum, but I'm having a difficulty actually describing it. Mm -hmm. um, it's this feeling that, um, it's a very childlike feeling that unless she agrees and approves, that it's not valid. I suppose I've... She's sort of interfered in my life all my life. Yeah, I can imagine so. And um, usually I do things and could do them because I didn't tell my parents and therefore they didn't spend the next six months. Trying to get you to tell you not to do it. Yeah, yeah, basically, basically, or <laughs> finding out I'd done it and telling me I should have done it in one of 500 different ways. But not the way you did it. That's right, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, yeah and, um, but I suppose having the head-to-heads with her there, um, when I was there, it, was, it sort of made me feel like I had more of a, a, a backbone. Yes, and this is why it was very good for you. It was good for you in one sense because you stood up for yourself with your mother for the really the first time in your life, mm -hmm. right? However, the part that wasn't so good is you came away with the feeling of this childhood feeling that you are not letting yourself get into, and that is this childhood feeling that unless mum approves of me doing it, then it's not valid, it's not real, it doesn't really make mm -hmm. any sense unless she approves. So that's that's underlying the feeling that I actually did quite well to... I sort of feel more like I'm my person now, but I obviously that's other feelings underneath it. Yeah, then what you're avoiding emotionally is this deep grief that for the majority of your life you've you've actually unknowingly done exactly what your parents want you to do, even though you've tried to do exactly the opposite. There's been this underlying emotion uh, there driving that uh, most of the decisions, looking for their approval and never having it. So there's this deep grief that mum's never going to approve of me, mm. that you came away uh, from after spending two months with her, but are not allowing yourself to feel. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So allow yourself just mm -hmm. to drop into that feeling now. At the moment, it, it was good that you stood up to her because that, that means you're starting to have some self-worth, some self-love. But what needs to happen now is allow yourself to feel the grief that mum is never going to approve of you. There's something... Mm -hmm. that, yeah, I'm trying to get it because it, the way I'm saying it's not quite right. There's this feeling that that you have that uh, mum, you are, as far as your mum is concerned, you're unlovable in her eyes. There is something intrinsically wrong with you that mum will never be able to love. I suppose that's just, I'm not good enough. Um, well, that, that's what drives the emotion of being not good enough, yeah. yeah. This is, it was the hat put on each of us as children. Like, I was the one who needed help all the time. And um, my brother was great and my sister. Yeah, you were, made, you were made to feel like no matter what you did, it was not going to be enough. Because even if I did manage to do what they wanted or said they wanted, they would still judge it negatively. Yeah, and that it wasn't done the right way. Or it wasn't, mm, yeah, yeah, exactly. And and while you're saying all of these things, I can feel you actually disconnecting from the emotion of it. Right? So what's actually happening right now even is that you are trying to keep, like while you're saying the words, you're having sort of the, so you're at the stage of intellectual realisation of what it's about, but still not letting yourself actually dive into the pool of the emotion of it. And that's the thing to pray about. Ask, ask God about helping you through this fear of getting out of the knowing what it's about and into the feeling what it's about. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay, that's been helpful. No worries.
there's another part to it. I think part of the having broken my leg, because I've been an insulin dependent diabetic for 35 years, and yep. I. At when the did moment, you first get diabetes? Uh, I was 20. 25 yeah. last year. Yep. And at the moment, it's just all over the place. I've been having hypos and people have to call ambulance and stuff like that. And it's just, I suppose, just before I broke my leg, um, I was glad it happened in the beginning because it meant that it, the condition seemed to be improving, but now it's more or less pretty much unmanageable more than anything else. Yep. And I'm, I'm assuming it's partly to do with everything else that's been going on. There's probably two primary things to look at with your diabetes. The first one is that you have an emotion within you uh, that began when you were around 20 years of age, in fact. Uh, and it caused the shutting down. It's a, it's a fear-based emotion. Uh, it caused the shutting down of the pancreas and t in terms of what's happening inside of your body. Um, if you look at some of the events surrounding when you were 20, it may help you actually identify the emotion of, that you're afraid of. Unfortunately, what happened at that time, because of that fear, a spirit who was also in a similar state to you became attached to you. So my suggestion is maybe to go to a person who can do a spirit removal or even pray to God for the removal of this spirit. But it's going to have to be a longing in your soul to remove it and then to deal with the underlying emotion inside of you that created the attachment. Allow yourself to feel uh, what that's about and then, and, then, and then talk to this spirit who is actually attached to you and is using your body in the same way that you're using it in, a, in order to pump you full of adrenaline in order to stay away from the emotion of fear and terror that you have. So let yourself connect to that emotion and then also talk to the spirit who's with you and hopefully the spirit will disconnect and if not, it's easy enough to remove that spirit at some point. Does that make sense? When the diabetes becomes unmanageable, it's because two of you are both interacting with the pancreas and into that area of your body, into the third chakra area of your body, and, and that's what's causing that part of your body to become unmanageable for, for one soul. So it's good for, for you to work through the emotion, but also to remove the attachment. Um, I've met quite a few ladies who have had spirit attachments with regard to diseases like diabetes. And usually they're usually resulting around some fear-based or terror-based event that occurred that they didn't release the emotion of fully. Right. Yeah. Or well, disaster sort of. A disaster basically. Yeah. 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 Okay. You can relate to that. So. Good day. Thank Sorry, thank, can we just thank thank Yeah. It, permission and approval, but there's quite a number of different emotions in there about mum, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Josh, you want to come up the chair or you want to a question? Yeah, no worries. Um, my question came up when Jen was up before. Yep. And because when she was feeling through getting to where she was, um, I saw her block, I saw where she was stuck, and it reminded me of where I was yesterday and where I've been most of the time. Yep. Most of the time stuck on this thing. Um, and it's sort of the question of uh, now it's all it's washed past my mind now <laughs> all this whole stuff that, like between that whole discussion and um, it, I've just been in I feel like I've hyper, hyperventilated my state of being into this alternative state of you know like I've got all these tingles through my whole body that's been lasting the last half hour and um I just have this feeling that there's a bunch of spirits around me that have been hanging around waiting for me to ask this question. I feel that, that there's this lot of spirits there as well. Um, the question is like, why, why is it like why is it so hard to volunteer in that moment when there's a block 
when, when there's this, you're totally stuck. And, and it feels like, I, I feel, okay, I've felt grief before, and everyone here has grief. Everyone wants, you know, wants to get to their grief. But that desire to get to the grief, and then in the moment, like, if we take that to God and be, okay, God, help me with this one. Come on, I want to get to the grief now because I'm sick of talking about it. Um, why, why is it so, I can't articulate it, my mind's washed. Why is it so hard to, to actually feel the grief when you feel you want to feel it? Yeah, I feel I want, like, because I've felt grief before, I know what it feels like, and the actual feeling of the grief doesn't feel bad, it feels great, I feel like I actually enjoy feeling grief. Yep. And I know I've got grief, yep. why is there this big issue with getting to the grief right now? That's a good question. Um, with every single emotion, like so, while grief is the healing emotion on the majority of occasions, the type of grief will be linked to events which are linked to different belief systems. And usually, the the problem is usually that it's not so much the grief that we're afraid of experiencing, but this particular type of grief or what it's actually connected with. So to give you an example, let's say you may have no trouble at all crying about how someone else has been hurt, but you may have terrible trouble crying about how you've been hurt. In both cases, you might cry the same amount even, so you're not scared about crying. It's what you're crying about that you're afraid of accessing. So the majority of times what's happening inside of us is that we are um, dealing with different groups of emotions, some of which we are more afraid of than others. And it's the ones that we are more afraid of that we have more locked up grief about, generally. And, and the, that particular facet feels worse to us at that moment. And that's why we can't access the grief, even though we've cried before. So, for example, I've cried many, many times about all sorts of issues. But there's one issue, which is an issue about God that I've currently got, that I'm working my way through, that I'm still having trouble accessing the grief of, because for me it feels like the grief is so big that it's just going to be like I'm going to die feeling this grief. Now, I have felt that way with all of the other griefs I've felt too, and I didn't die, but that's not helping me get to the bottom of this one, and I need to just allow myself to keep reminding myself, I've got this issue with God, it's about grief, pray about it, keep praying about it, and eventually the desire will be greater than the fear. And when the desire is greater than the fear, you will instantly experience it. Is the, this hyperventilating experience getting through any block to getting to what I'm trying, what I'm trying to get to? It, or is, what it, is that? it could be, and that's why you just need to trust a lot of what the body is doing. So there, there are a lot of really good therapies that are available today which connect you to your body and actually allow you to trust what the body is doing. So allow yourself to trust your body. So remember yesterday when you were up here and you started to shake and if you, could have, if you trust that feeling that's in your body, you'll get to the emotion that that shaking was all about and then you'll get to the grief that was under that emotion. I feel like the fear, there's a lot of fear because like I said before you, to you once that I'm like an extre extremist, yep. but like Mary, like I need to, like right now I've, I've taken on the vegan challenge, I said to Tristan before, I've taken on the vegan challenge, <laughs> and my fear is, okay, well that's probably doing something physiologically to me to make me hyperventilated, and that goes along with the whole feeling that this is a cold, and that one of the tactics is to get you hyperventilated and all that. <laughs> To make you feel like you're on a nice space with spirits around you. Yeah. And, you know, there's, there's fears there. The, tr the truth is when you stop eating meat, there will be more spirits who can connect to you and your spirit connection will be stronger. The problem with that is if I'm holding on to an emotion, then whatever the attraction is going to be, I'm going to fill those spirits with me and fill them stronger. So that, yes, there will be a result to that. So the, the, the key is to understand that everything that happens to you, as you refine yourself and bring yourself more morally into, you know, love, what, what would be love, what's going to happen is there will be changes in your body and there will be changes happening to you with regard to spirit connection and that will certainly have an impact on you and the way you process emotion. And you have quite a lot of fear related to spirits, related to your childhood. 
So I watched that movie you suggested last night and it freaked the shit out of me. Yeah, yeah. And I said, I'm going to deal with that last. We'll do everything first. Right. Well, it's highly unlikely you'll do that. you probably deal with that next, I would say. The way oh, shit. <laughs> and, 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 that's, and that's probably what this is related to. This, this deep uh, fear you have about the spirit world, which is what began in you at a, quite a young age because of some of the things you saw then. So allow yourself just to work your way through that emotionally. You, when you feel terror, and this applies to everyone, when you feel terror, you will be shaking and you will be feeling terrified. Pray to God. Remember, every single time, pray to God through things. Pray to God through things. Don't neglect that relationship with God and that will help you through everything. So um, as long as you connect with God and allow yourself to connect, have, maintain that connection, you'll get through absolutely everything. So if I want to deal with whatever my law of attraction is right now with this whole situation, um, what's your suggestion? Because I do feel stuck. Like, would I need to leave the building and go deal with some stuff to get into it, or what? Well, no. What you're feeling at the moment is you are feeling some fear inside of you, and uh, and and that's what triggers this. Is this a cult? Is this a thing? Are they mind controlling me? And all that kind of stuff. It's the fear within you that's triggering that, those those thoughts. So just allow yourself now, even bodily, and you can feel yourself starting to shake and everything, allow yourself to experience the fear. So I've had to do that many times myself to get through that phase. But if the fear's there because there's a causal emotion, and, and you say that we can, we can volunteer... But, but this is actually childhood fear, and you will need to experience it. Okay, so you that is, in a way, in itself, a causal thing? Yeah, you can tell by how you're shaking and how you're twitching and your body's moving around. Usually that's an indication of childhood emotion that's been suppressed. Yep. So allow yourself to experience that childhood emotion without resistance. That's the key here. It's not, a, it's not an adult thing where you're, tr you're trying to be afraid of something in order to deny something else. This is a childhood feeling of fear or terror that you will experience. Okay, yep. thanks for that. No worries. Now, it's uh, 25 to 6, so it's actually we've time, to, time to finish for the moment. And um, thank you very much today. I hope today has been a little bit more informative about how you can use your anger to dig down and also what's underneath, you know, that starting to see what's underneath those, those feelings and emotions you have. I'd like to thank very much everyone's uh, personal comments and participation today. It's been really good. I'd also like to thank you very much for your donations over the last uh, three days too because they've been very helpful to me and Mary as well. So thank you very much for that. Thank you for your time.